right, right, right. What we're going to do. Was it, um, Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call to order the uh, Wednesday, May 25th meeting of the Site Plan Review and Appearance Board. And uh, Rochelle, if you could call roll of the members. Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Bryce Patton? Here. John Brewer? Here. Rita Post Adler? Here. Stephen Cohen? Here. Todd LaRue? Here. Our next item is approval of the agenda. Uh, Ms. Alvarez, do we have any changes? changes? Thank you. Can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Thank you, Annette. And a second? Second. That was Dana, I believe. Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Grace Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Todd LaRue? Yes. We have one set of meeting minutes from a prior meeting from February 9th, 2022. I trust you've all had an opportunity to review those. Uh, any corrections or changes we need to make? All right, seeing none, uh, if I could get a motion to approve. Move to approve February 9th, 2022. Thank you, Annette, and a second? Second. Thank you, Dana. Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Grace Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Todd LaRue? Yes. At this point in the meeting, we will swear in the public that chooses to speak on this. Anyone who is going to be speaking tonight on any item on the agenda, or if uh, there's an item that you're going to speak on that is not on the agenda, please rise and prepare to be sworn in. <laughs> By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony of the state of Florida is nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Much of this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the city of Delray Beach's quasi-judicial rules, so I'm going to read those rules now. This hearing will be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach's quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city will be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. Board members, staff, and the applicant will be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made on the personal views as to whether or not a project is a good project or not nor may the decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. At this point in the meeting, we take comments from the public on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. If you have any comment uh, about issues that uh, might otherwise come before the board but are not on tonight's agenda, something that you want to say about our performance or practice, et cetera, now is your opportunity. Seeing and hearing none, I will close that portion of the meeting and we will move on to uh, <coughs> item eight, uh, quasi-judicial items, and I believe our first item will be item 8A and Ms. Buse. Hi, um, good evening. Item 8A is Opal Grand Hotel. It is 2022-167, and this is a class one site plan modification. Um, is anyone here? from Gary's office yet. No. We want to hold it and see if uh, someone else shows up from their office. And yes, yeah, please. Chair, if we can just get a motion to amend the agenda to move item 8A to the end. Yes, so we'll move uh, item 8A to um, essentially item 8G. Uh, if I could get a motion to that effect. Motion to move agenda 8A to item 8G, as in girl. Second. All right. Okay. Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Bryce Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Todd LaRue? Yes. And we will move forward with the uh, item 8B and Mr. Carruthers.
Slide show at the top. What's it to next to view to the left of you? Left. And then go to from the beginning on the left. Okay. Use the clicker. Okay. Uh, my name is Octavius Carruthers, assistant planner. I'll be presenting item 8B, Delray Tire and Auto Shop, 90 North Congress Avenue. Is anyone here to present? If someone from the applicant here on this item. Okay, this is very unusual. Jerry, I do know that uh, 95 North is shut down around the Pompano Beach area. So if anybody's coming from the south, that may be why we have a few <laughs> people late. But if we'll do another uh, motion to amend to make 8B, now 8H. Correct. Get a motion to that effect, please. I'll move to to um, make item 8B um, H. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you, Annette. So it's Carol and Annette. B to 8H. Okay. Uh, Nick Wright? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Bryce Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Gina Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Todd LaRue? Yes. All right, we'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> Time's a charm. It's abuse. Okay, this is Lake Colonial at Atlantic Crossing. It's item 2022-147, and it is a class one site plan modification. Is anyone here for that item? <laughs> wow. Maybe we just ask who's here. Maybe we should ask who's here and what right. item they're here for. We might want to do that. Gary's, Gary's walking in right now. Okay. Gary, I believe you weren't sworn in, so immediately proceed to the podium to be yes. sworn in. And while he's doing that, why don't you use this podium over here, please? Do you want me to start with him? I mean, is that what we're well, I'm, I'm not sure if this item is Gary's or not. It might. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, <laughs> move. So get him sworn in, and we'll figure it out. I the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, let's get a motion to move uh, eight. What is it? C to H. G back to I. eight I. A, and we'll go ahead and proceed from there. We're moving back. Eight G. <laughs> eight A. Let's get a motion to that effect. Motion to amend the agenda to move item eight C to item eight I as an indigo. Um, let's let's leave see where it is and and move um, what we had moved to uh, G back to A. Say what now? So uh, Gary was for item which was originally eight A, which was modified to eight G. Okay. Um, Gary, are you also doing the uh, law colonial? No. Okay. So it looks like the applicant for eight C is also not here right now. So the chair is asked to uh, amend the agenda to modify it back so that 8G would become 8A again, and we would call 8A as uh, Gary's now present. Okay, motion to modify the agenda to reverse 8G to 8A now that the applicant is present. Thank second. You. Even that was a second from you? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And that gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Bryce Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. On the room? Yes. Great. All right, Jen, if you want to put that item on the record. 
that was Gary sworn in? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, item file number 2022-167. This is a class one site plan modification, and this is the Opal Grand Hotel. Board members, any ex parte communication on this item? No. No. All right. Um, Mr. Iliopoulos. Jennifer, do you control it or do I? Oh. Um, we're really off tonight. I, I, you know, I thought the meeting was at 6. I didn't know that. <laughs> Clearly, I'm out of the loop. Um, for the record, Gary Leopolis, address is 1045 East Atlantic Avenue. Our firm is GE Architecture. Uh, we are the firm that's been working on the Opal Grand over the last uh, few years during the renovation that you guys have seen. Um, Tonight what we're dealing with is, uh, due to the size of the hotel, uh, I'm going to go through and show you basically a little bit of history on one of the first slides on how the hotel used to function and what we're proposing tonight. Uh, let me just see here if I get this right. Well, that wasn't it. Okay. So this is the original site plan back in 96. Hotel was built in 82. It was a Holiday Inn, for those who might know, might not know. Uh, the access was off of Atlantic. Uh, in this slide, there's an old, I don't know, can you point with this one here or no? no. Anyways, there was an old drive-through uh, where you drop people off and you went to the back of the hotel and you went down a ramp. That's how you got to the garage. Um, in 96, they expanded the hotel. They changed it from a Holiday Inn to a Marriott. Um, what you're hearing about now, the Opal. The Opal is the Walsh family. They are local uh, developer hotel family here in Delray Beach. They're corporate headquarters. They own over 150 hotels around the country. Their personal brand is the Opal. So you'll hear Opal Pearl, Opal Sand, Opal Grand. Those are their own hotels. So this is no longer a Marriott. It is the Walsh family's hotel. Um, so what's happening is in this slide right here, we basically had a very small area for the employees. Um, this ramp that is along the back, you, you no longer use. And let's just see here. I'm sorry. Guys. So that's the ramp that goes down to the old garage. The actual entrance to the hotel garage is on the north side of the hotel now. So what we're proposing to do is actually enclose the ramp. Uh, we're still within the footprint of the hotel. Uh, how this works with hotels and parking. Usually when you're expanding the square footage, you have to provide parking. When it's actually a part of the hotel service, you don't have to provide additional parking. So therefore, we're fine on parking. There right there is the ramp. And then what's happening is what you're seeing connecting back into the hotel is actually what was the employee lounge. It's a real small area, basically for a handful of the employees. Uh, due to the size of the hotel, they really do need a lot more room now for their employees. This is now what we're proposing. We're actually uh, now facing the west side of the parking lot, but we've taken a lot of existing openings. We've enclosed them with glass for the employees. We've given them their own eating area. We've also expanded their locker rooms so they have more facilities and bathrooms. Uh, this is the west elevation as it is today. These are the existing openings. Uh, the large one was actually the original opening going down into the parking garage down below. And basically now we are proposing storefront glass uh, along the left-hand side here, you're seeing some horizontals. Those are actually a new compactor location that we're actually enclosing into the building. And we also have a laundry facility that's being provided for the hotel. And that is the finished product along the west. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to see because there is a, a lot of the right-hand side here, their gray portion. That's actually a ramp that's going up onto that parking deck. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Should you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. 
So this is a consideration of a class one um, with the west elevation. Um, as Gary stated, um, this um, does have a long history. It is zoned CBD um, and adjacent zonings are open space, community facilities. Um, to the east we have the Atlantic Ocean and there is a little bit of multifamily. So instead of going through the long history, I found some old photos. The Seacrest Hotel um, is the original hotel that was on site. It was built in 1926, and I believe it remained there until 1982, 1983. And then here, um, it was the Holiday Inn and then went into the Marriott. And you can see here where some of the Anglo-Caribbean started to take place. And then here is the Marriott and the Opal Grant. Um, again, this is where most of the work is being done, where the ramp is. <clears throat> and then these are the um, enclosures. And um, the interior um, site work, if it was just the interior site work, of course, it wouldn't be um, before you tonight. Um, they are installing the roll-up doors here where the um, laundry and the trash and the recycling compactors are going to be and um, the glass right over here. Um, there are findings um, which require the board action, and there are also um, architect architectural elevation findings that you have to um, find to, which is in section 4618, and these are your three criteria for board action. There are also um, some policies and objectives that support it from the comprehensive plan. And this is the west elevation completed. And these are just some of the, um, again, the, the changes that have taken place and how it stayed consistent. The DDA um, did recommend approval on May uh, 10th. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this item? All right, seeing and hearing none. Uh, Mr. Eliopoulos, any additional testimony or rebuttal that you'd like to make? No, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And city? No. All right, so to the board then. And Carol, would you like to start? Sure, I don't have any issues with it. I think it's fine. Scary. Thank you. Annette? I, I actually have a question for staff. Um, if I remember this, project several edition ago, the Marriott, some of that space that's being enclosed used to be used as surface lot parking for employees. When the applicant says that parking is a non-issue, does that include staff parking? Or will staff park now? It's not. The surface park is not being included in it. Okay. And again, the staff parking is not included in the parking ratio. Okay, so they still have their parking. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, no other issues. Thank you. Huh? Uh, no, I don't have anything. Tina? No comments. Bryce? Yeah, uh, Jen, the, uh, the construction that's going on now at the southwest corner of the building, is that, is that a project that, we're, that was approved that you referenced on um, October 20th, 2020? Yes. That was two years ago. Yes. No questions. Okay. Steven? Uh, yeah. So I guess I don't, I don't understand, like, why are these roll-up uh, doors? I don't quite get that. So what we're doing is, is basically, in some of them, you have the recycling. So a lot of the recycling bins are in there. So if we had it out in the open, then we were worried about things blowing on into the, the parking lot. Also, we have the laundry drop-off. So a lot of times when they're dropping off the laundry, the laundry bins, depending on whether we're picking them up or delivering them, uh, they actually weigh like 1,000 pounds if they're wet towels and stuff like that. But they don't want those to be outside, so we wanted to have those enclosed. And there's also air conditioning being fed into those areas, so there's no odors. We do have rooms right above these areas, so we're trying to minimize the noise for the guests. Are there also roll-up doors to the men's room and the women's room? Is that is that what I saw? Or did I, I, I I hope not. Um, I mean, I mean, I was no disrespect. If you wanted to see them, we would do it. But um, it's like, no. What, what is what is happening? We um, <laughs> so where I'm looking at the plans here. 
I might have okay, cut it off. So Gary, what, uh, put yours on. Oh, either way, I, I was going to say it's, it's basically a hallway that's connecting. So the hallway that connects to their locker rooms is also their bathrooms, but it's all enclosed. There is no roll-up door for that. Oh, I must have been looking at it from the, okay, on the east, on the east side. Okay, all right. I don't have any further questions. And just to help, because there was a question about parking, we actually exceed the required parking for this hotel by uh, plus 100 spaces. Uh, to um, Price's comment, the construction that's going on is actually an elevator tower and stairs that is for the event deck that will be over the restaurant, which the board already approved. It also will go up five stories because it's going to connect a new wing that we had approved to add on the, which would be the southwest corner of the property. Okay, I have nothing to add. I think it's um, pretty straightforward and um, entertain a motion. Possible motions are in the- I'll uh, move staff. approval. Okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll move approval of the class one site plan modification 2022-167 for the Upper Grand Hotel located at 10 North Ocean Boulevard, associated with elevation changes to the west elevation by finding that the request is consistent with the land development regulations in the comprehensive plan. Thank Second. you, Bryce. And I'm sorry, didn't catch who the second was. Yeah, thank you. Nick Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Price Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Tom Leroux? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and sorry I was late. <laughs> Not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, moving back to our regularly scheduled agenda. Um, kind of. We are going to go ahead and uh, see? let's see. Is anyone here for Le Colonial? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Jen, I think that's your item. And I don't believe you were here when we uh, did the swearing in, were you? I was not. Okay. I just arrived. All right, is there anybody else who just arrived who needs to get sworn in? All right, thank you. Ready? Please raise your right hand. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And Chair, we, before we start, we have one member, I believe, that needs to step down. Yes, I do need to step down because I'm a consultant for the project. Okay, thank you. Are we making a motion to, oh no, we'll the second. You don't have to undo it because it was. A no, we, we actually didn't modify we didn't 9C. Modify we were about to when, okay. when Gary arrived, so okay. we're still okay. <clears throat> okay, the file number is 2022-147 and this is Lake Colonial for at Atlantic Crossing and the applicant is here. All right, sir, if you could come over to the podium over here and uh, state your name and address for the record. Board members, any ex parte communication on this item? No. No. Nope. nope. All right. Seeing and hearing none, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Mark Nauer, president of Nauer Incorporated, the architects for La Colonial at uh, Atlantic Crossing. And should I start? Yes, please. Okay. So we were here oh, back in November, um, and first of all, I need to apologize. My plane is two hours late, so um, but I just got here. Anyway, so uh, we were back here uh, in November. Or we were here in November. You approved uh, some Class Two uh, uh, site plan uh, changes, and now we're back with a few minor changes uh, based on our uh, evolution of the drawings. Um, and uh, so there are eight items that we would like to bring to your attention uh, can, can this you morning. Hold on one second. We're trying to fix that, and neither one of us can see. Jen, if you'll just go down just a little and to the left. No, to the right now. There you go. No, up, left. Just a little left. There you go. And now the far left option. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Jen's been great, by the way. Thank you for getting all this <laughs> together. Okay, so there are eight items that uh, I would like to uh, address here. Um, 
the <laughs> we're probably the first people who have ever come in here and said we want to reduce the size of our sign. We want a smaller sign and a smaller entrance canopy. So uh, if you could just scroll, or can I do this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at that. That's the history. You all know where this is, right? I don't have to go through all of the detail um, and the site plan. Come on. There we go. So what was previously approved is on the left here. It is a larger canopy that uh, filled the entire opening between in the arch um, at the entrance um, and covered two side lights. Um, what we're proposing is to have a canopy and smaller sign that is more in keeping with uh, the brand and the other entrances. It's a much more intimate uh, experience as you enter. Um, so we're looking at reducing the sign uh, from 147 inches to 95 inches, reducing the canopy, and just having the double French doors uh, that you see in the center photo. That's, that's actually uh, our restaurant in Houston. Um, so that's essentially what you're going to see, uh, and that's what we're proposing. That's uh, what we've uh, put in the drawing today. Um, so that's number one. Um, smaller canopy, smaller sign. Um, the one thing that it does do that I think you know probably needs to be addressed, and probably why this was flagged when we went in for a, a building permit, is because we are reducing the entrance side lights. So there's not as much glazing at the entrance, uh, creating this more intimate arrival uh, experience. Uh, the second item is, uh, let's, we'll go to, um, we did have a railing previously, um, and we were going to put some pots and things like that. Well, um, we th just think it's a much better experience, easier to control, the planting will last better, to, to continue the planters, the, the hard planters with the irrigation around the corner. Um, and enhance the landscaping in this area as well. So that's uh, the uh, second item. The third item is that we were going to replace the structure of the pergola. Um, but when we saw what was actually built, it looked really, really good. So we're all very excited about it. Um, so we're going to keep the columns that are there but we're actually we're proposing to add a little bit of white uh, structure to the top of it to uh, act as a backdrop for some additional landscaping that we're proposing to uh, have grow over all of it. Um, the uh, water feature um, was approved previously. The lighting was all approved previously and meets all of the code requirements and those types of things, um, but it is, uh, keeping the uh, five uh, existing columns and uh, structure. Um, so that's actually three and four. Um, and as we look at this, there's probably better I can go back here. Um, we, uh, we have a bamboo ceiling underneath this, and so we're proposing to lower it. Um, so we're giving you all the changes from what was approved the last time. Um, and the reason we're lowering it is that we couldn't get all of the electric and everything above the bamboo. And we don't want everyone to walk in and see exposed uh, everything uh, up there. So uh, that it, we're lowering that. Um, the paving system. Uh, okay. okay, so at the entrance uh, in the old... Um, uh, plan we had uh, a tile um, that we have found in other restaurants to be slippery so we decided here to go to a uh, more uh, a, a, a tile with a higher coefficient of friction so that it's safer um, and 
uh, we don't have that the encaust the encaustic tile that we previously had uh, that you approved. Um, so what we're proposing now is to use this porcelain product that looks like slate, um, and it's in the uh, uh, in the package that was sent. Um, so that's we are proposing that the encaustic tile be underneath the pergola. Um, it's still there, uh, but we can keep that dry. Uh, we just don't want it slippery uh, when it's raining. Okay, then I'll go back one more. Sorry to keep going back and forth. We used to have, we, uh, you approved a sign, uh, and we were asking you to do so over the uh, bar that's along the plaza. Um, and the sign was going to say bar. Well, it dawned on us, we don't have a sign anywhere that says Love Colonial from this direction or from the, the plaza. So, uh, and we thought bar was probably not appropriate for the quality of restaurant that we're proposing. So uh, we're, uh, we'd like to change that sign to a La Colonial sign. Um, it's quite small. Um, it's the same square footage as the bar sign. So we're not asking for any more signage. We're just asking for the name change. That's all. And then lastly, the eighth item here is, and this is in the elevations. And there's some enhanced landscaping here. And please don't ask me to get into the landscape. This is not my area of expertise. Um, but if you have any questions, I. trying to deal with it. Um, okay, so along the plaza, what was previously approved was to, to pull out uh, two, the first two bays of windows and uh, infill them, because that's the kitchen. Well, as we, the more we dug into this, we said, you know, we're pretty proud of the kitchen and the staff that we have, so let's let people see into the kitchen. Um, it'll save a few dollars, which is always an issue when it comes to this stage of the project, but it will also um, help to uh, animate the plaza and not create these blank walls as people walk by. So they'll see that activity. Um, we are strategically uh, underneath the uh, work surfaces where there will be some uh, electric and plumbing connections. Uh, going to black that out um, so you don't have to look at the plumbing, but you uh, that now everyone walking through the plaza will be able to see into the kitchen. That's the plan. So, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And again, my apologies for being late. I'll answer, I'll answer any questions. Um, again, this is a class one site plan modification um, associated with some minor elevations in landscaping. Um, my presentation is quite similar. Um, I, this is um, in the CBD and we have, it is surrounded by CBD on all sides, but on the north where there is some um, RM. The last site plan modification um, was a class two and it was with uh, Hampton Social and Lay Colonial. So as stated, they are reducing the overall size of the entry canopy and re removing the side lights and reducing the signage. And I just wanna mention right now that because the signage is being reduced, it does not have to come back um, for an amendment to the master sign program. 
The minor changes to support the post of the pergola by adding the white stucco and the lowering of the bamboo for um, the lighting and some of the enhanced landscaping and the material change. <clears throat> Again, we have the fixed planters and um, the entry of the, the iron gates being, I'm sorry, being removed. Here we go again with just the whole overview and the entry. And these are the elevations. This is where the windows are being um, proposed. And here is the landscaping. <clears throat> this is just an enhancement and this was reviewed by the landscape planner for um, compliance. The DDA did recommend approval for um, at 6-0, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this item? All right, seeing and hearing none, we will close that portion of the meeting and we'll move on. Do you have any additional testimony or rebuttal to the city's testimony? I do not. All right, Jen? I do not. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, would you like to start? Uh, the only comment I have is that I thought the, the iron gate was something pretty special. Uh, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've seen much of that on, on the avenue. And the, the fixed planters look amazing too, but I just thought that since you guys seem to be going like all out, I just think that iron would be better. That's just my opinion. But other than that, I, everything looks great, fantastic. So, all right, thank you, Bryce. Yeah, I I appreciate it when clients come back and uh, try and make a good project better. Um, it's uh, it's refreshing. Um, the so, but the, the the grill over the the entryway that's still going to be crafted in Paris and brought over and all that stuff. That's all. That's all the same. Yeah. And the um, and the bamboo ceiling and the and the pergola is that is that just hanging there? Is that storm rated? What's it is storm rated. It's storm rated. It was not an easy detail to figure out, by the way. Yes, yeah. it, it's on a rigid system. Okay. Yeah. No, I think they're all. It, it's making it better and better. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have, I have oh, a quick sorry. question. A quick question for Jen. The, um, the this has nothing to do with what's before us, but the the, the building to the the north of, of this building, where the where the uh, greenery has been added on the second floor, is that was that it's administratively approved? I can't tell if it's real or plastic. It's not real, and I believe we approved that. Is that part of the crossing? Yep. Okay. Never mind. Yep. We had a lot of discussion about it. You may not have been here that night. That's my vague recollection. We have to go back and look at meeting notes. <laughs> Dana. I think it's terrific. No comments. John? Nope, nothing to add. Matt? Yeah, I think that's the question I have. The, the new landscaping that's hanging um, with a proposed white background is that artificial or is it real real and so we've had some projects come back to us in terms of maintenance and how arduous it is over time because of dripping water and and the maintenance of that so i'm not sure how it's installed but have you get some thought to that yeah, again not my area of expertise but uh the landscape architects assure us that it can be done Oh, I, I'm sure it can be done. Yeah. It's just over time, the maintenance and the keep the crisp, clean look and feel of it. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I can assure you is that I, you're, I'm blessed to have great clients that take care of their properties. This client takes care of their properties. So both the, both the landlord and the tenant here. So. I think it's a great intent, and that has always been the case. The intent is to do something fantastic, but over time, the maintenance and the frequency of the maintenance yeah. becomes challenging. Um, those are just my comments, though. Thank you. Uh, Jen, question for you. Um, 
it looked like in some of the images that there was a um, LC on the awning. I don't believe we approved that on those awnings. Did is that just for appearances purposes in that rendering, or is that um, actually something that? I'd actually have to take a look at the um, master sign program, but I remember I thought it was every other one um, of the awnings being approved. I, yes, but the picture that we saw, I think, had two awnings right next to each other, both showing the LC on them, which was what struck me. Um, so, is this where you're speaking of? It may have been of? in the applicant's presentation and not in yours, but just um, want to make sure that we're not accidentally approving that um, because that's what appeared in the images that we are. No, I would assure you time. once um, the signage started coming in that I would look at it or it okay. would be looked at by staff. If, if I may, Jen, you're right, because in the master sign program, we did ask for the LC on every awning, and it was decided to do it on every other awning. It's just that what you see here are two pictures of the same. same. I, I think there was an image in your presentation that showed two awnings and continuously it, it, along the street front that yeah. both had the LC on them. So yeah, I just want to make sure that we... Yeah, my bad, because... I, I probably pulled the photo from the original mm -hmm. and stuck it in there. But you're you're absolutely right. It is every other awning. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. I have nothing further. So anyone, someone want to make a motion? Move approval of the request for the Class 1 2022-147 site plan and architectural elevations for La Colonial located at 601 East Atlantic Avenue by finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Thank you, Dana. And a second. Second. Thank you, Annette. Isn't that Frank? Yes. Joel Perot stepped down. Frank Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Gina Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Tom Maru? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Much appreciated. Someone let uh, Carol know we are done with that item and we can have her back. And we are now on to 8D once she returns to the podium. <coughs> All right, Jen, if you want to introduce the item, and then we'll do sure. ex parte. Um, this is 502 East Atlantic Avenue. This is an amendment to the master sign program, and it's file number 2022-119. Thank you. Any ex parte communication on this item? No. 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 All right, Mr. Gregory, if you want to introduce yourself and state your address and uh, floor is yours, take it away. Mark Gregory, MG Concepts is my company, 18 Selena Avenue, number 29, Delray Beach, Florida. Um, this is a <coughs> modification to a sign program that we brought before the board. The board had comments. I went back to my client. We worked it out, and we're going to have a new presentation, and we have addressed your comments. Um, let's see. Let's hope I can get this right. Yeah, there we go. I'm just going to go through this quickly. These are past signs that have been at this site. This is another historic sign. We had two signs up top. This is uh, an old sign that was on this um, north elevation. These are some signs around the neighborhood on the corners. This is a location map showing uh, in red where the site is on Atlantic Avenue and uh, Federal Highway, southbound. Um, this is a proposed sign we're putting for the small restaurant on the uh, east side of this project. Now you'll note we removed the sign for the real estate office that was on that more uh, western side. This is a close-up. Now this dimension over here, it's 11 foot wide sign, 17 for the big letters and then 6.5 for the smaller letters. It's got an overall height of about 28 inches. And this will be important late, a little later on in this presentation. This is an, a sign that's been permitted under the old program. This is a picture of this sign. 
Um, this is a projecting sign, which was an addition. This goes over there, or actually beside their entrance on the uh, west side of the building. This is a view of some types of letters that was, they look black during the day and then they have white accents at night. Uh, this is an under canopy sign. Now we're entitled to two under canopy signs. I wanted to expand upon this, that they wanted to have it illuminated similar to the wine room across the street. Uh, this is a directory. In lieu of what we had wanted to do with the real estate sign, staff had recommended a directory for the building and the owners thought it was a great idea. So we included the directory. Um, this is a breakdown of what we wanted to do. Now, now, it's not three wall signs. It's only gonna be two wall signs right now. We would like to keep the option open for a third wall sign, but we have to meet the criteria that, of staff. Um, we have two under canopy signs, the one projecting sign and the directory sign. Now, going back to the one with opal and ore, um, it's the 30 inches overall height. I, I put that in as a kind of an arbitrary number. I, what I really need is 20 inches to make that sign work. The new, the new, the old criteria was only 24 inches. So uh, to put the two lines and have a little spacing and all of that, I, I need like 28. So I asked for 30, I can accept 28. All right, um, that's the end of my presentation. I'll be here for any comments. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Go up to again. slideshow and the menus on the top, and then yeah, I can't see again. I have the wrong glasses. <laughs> <laughs> to the right, right, right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Click. This one on the left. I'm so embarrassed right now. <laughs> okay. No, it's okay. I'm doing the same thing today. Okay. Um. <laughs> This is a consideration of an amendment to the blanket sign program. It was before you guys on um, March 23rd. Um, this 502 East Atlantic is in the CBD. Um, these are just some photos. Um, this building has been painted several times and this is what it looks like now. Uh, it was before the board in 2014 and 2015 and it never, we never got to a um, to where the amendment could be uh, amended. So it kind of stopped and they came back this year. This is the approved blanket sign program where there are individual channel letters on the wireway, um, white face, black trim, register trademarks are allowed. Maximum letter height um, is 21, 24 inches for one line of copy. And then the combination is uh, 10 inches for the first line, 10 inches for the lower line, or 15 inches for the top, six inches for the lower. The proposed is generally one line for the 24 inches, which is gonna remain the same. And then there's a bit of an, an increase for the two lines of copy. They are adding one projecting sign on the west elevation, a directory sign on the north elevation, and an under canopy on the north elevation, and they want the option of reverse channel letters, which is an up-to-date uh, type of channel letter. These are uh, the LDRs for master sign and blanket sign program, and 467D2 is the aesthetic qualifications. This is um, a type of a unique building. They're, the architecture limits the type of signage you can have on the building and the second floor does contain office space which again we normally do not allow uh, one tenant to have the uh, space for second floor uh, signage. 
This sign was approved administratively as it met the current sign program. This sign is a part, this particular sign isn't, but this space where it is, it's at is an approved sign location, and this is a new sign that they would like to put up. This is a proposed sign. And again, this is this, they removed the uh, second story sign and proposed the uh, directory signage, and it's going to go in between these two windows on the north elevation. And the projecting sign, there is a new uh, section of the code that when it is in the right of way that an agreement has to uh, be made. And I believe that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing and hearing none, Mr. Gregory, do you have any additional comments no, or rebuttal? No, I'm here to answer your question. All right, and Jen? I do not. All right. Uh, no, the uh, applicant appears to have uh, listened to our comments and, and uh, responded accordingly. I'm, I'm just so glad it's a different color, frankly. Um, but the, light, the lighting looks clean. It's, uh, it's nice. It's, not, it's, not, um, uh, it's, it's a nice, clear font. Um, so I, I've got no, no problems with it. Thanks. So yeah, I think it looks very tasteful, and I'm thrilled that um, Ms. Buse could help you out with the um, with the directory, um, and that the clients were happy. So I think it looks terrific, and uh, great job, great collaboration. John, uh, nothing to add. No. No comments. Good job. Carol. Oh. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, I think the sign looks a, a little t tad too big, so I would approve this with the 28 inches. I think that would be better because you're talking about the one that the op that one. So yes, actually, that that is 28 inches. I had asked for 30 for maybe a future okay. project, um, but this is about 28 inches. You have 17 for the first line of copy, 6.5, and about four inches spaces in between. Okay. All right. Thank you. For listening to all of our comments. Stephen? Talking about page six of the staff report? taken from a photograph and we superimposed it but basically standing in a parking spot looking up at about 40 degree angle so the other one's a straight on elevation where we superimposed it and this is within, within all of the uh, parameters of the sign program what you're saying yes I really have nothing to add. I think the, uh, if you haven't seen the building since it got painted, it looks delightful. It's a big improvement. Um, and I think this is good. I think that's appropriate in size for the, the scale of the, the building, and I think it's a good fit. So I'm comfortable with uh, the 30 inches. I don't think we need to drop it to 28. I think anything else that it would be approved for that is going to be fine in that space. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, someone want to make a motion? Move approval of the amendment to the blanket sign program 2022-119 located at 502 East Atlantic Avenue based upon positive findings to LDR section 4.6.7 F2A. Thank you, Dana. And a second? I'll second. Thank you, Carol. Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Grace Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Anna Post-Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Tom LaRue? Yes.
you, Mr. Thank Gregory. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thanks. All right, we can move on to uh, item 8E. <laughs> Good afternoon, Brian Richard, Transportation Planner, City of Delray Beach, here to present item 8E for the record, 2020, file number Friday, excuse me, file number 2021-236 ABR. This is a waiver for the abandonment of right-of-way. The applicant, the agent are here to present, so I'm gonna turn it over to Bonnie, Ms. School. Um, Thank you very much, Brian. Good evening, Mr. Before Chairman. Before we get started, let me just check for ex parte communication. Any uh, ex parte on this item? Yes, okay. I had a conversation with Mr. Jim Knight. Okay. Yeah, I did too. Same. I had a conversation with Bonnie, Ms. School. Oh, and I, um, I, drove, I drove the alley. I tried to drive the alley. It's hard to get through. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right, Ms. Miskell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Bonnie Miskell, I'm here on behalf of the applicant. And uh, I think like Jen, my, my eyesight's not very good from this angle, but I'll do my best. So you know, forget that. We're pulling out the glasses and we're doing it from paper. Okay. So um, we are here this evening um, because there's a section of the land development regulations that um, was amended a, a few years back, or probably longer than that, section 4.4.13J1C that says streets and alleys may not be abandoned, vacated, or closed to facilitate new development. That section of code waivers are allowed and waivers have been approved. So we're here this evening to, to ask you not whether the abandonment should occur necessarily, that's not your purview, but whether a waiver would be appropriate in this instance. So we'll get into the details and there are criteria that I'm gonna go through with you. So again, we're applying to, um, for a waiver to allow the Planning and Zoning Board and ultimately the City Commission to consider the request for an abandonment given the conditions and circumstances associated with this particular portion of the alley. Um, and, and I'm going to show you lots of pictures, but it relates to not the entire alley. It's a small section of the alley. I'm, I'm referring to it as a T, but it's not really a T because half of the T is missing. And that portion is located adjacent to or contiguous to 201 and 213 Southeast 2nd Avenue and 206 Southeast 3rd. SPRAB is not acting on the abandonment, only the waiver request. Um, if, if you should agree to approve this, then it will simply give us the opportunity to go through the process to provide why under these circumstances we should be given that consideration. Action taken this evening is not a vote in support or against the abandonment necessarily. It simply evaluates whether we meet the criteria for a waiver. So a little background on this section of the alley. Um, and, and I'm going to get into a lot of technical details. But as I mentioned, it's, 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 the, it's a, the west portion of the T as the east portion of the T had been abandoned previously. Um, the north-south section is a 16-foot platted alley, and the east-west is a 12-foot, as shown on the above. And so that is the area, and that is actually contiguous to um, property that is owned by my client. All right, and that shows you. So as I mentioned before, and you can see it on this diagram, that portion of the T had previously been abandoned. It was abandoned in 2019. It went through the process, and apparently the commission at the time agreed that it was appropriate that it not be um, completed as far as the rest of the alley. The, by the way, these are unimproved areas. There is no alley there today. We're talking about paper, okay? So it has a current L configuration, okay? And, and I'm gonna try to get a little bit faster here because a lot of this is somewhat redundant and I know Brian has this in his as well. So on the screen, 
The red set, this is the 12 foot section that was abandoned right there, I think, if I'm looking at this correctly, it's hard to look at it upside down. Mm -hmm. The yellow is, where, is part of our request and the orange is part of our request. And the area that is in red is my client's property. Now, south of that yellow is Improved Alley. The immediate lot, the, the lot immediately to the south is the C is was originally owned by the CRA is now a city owned lot that is parking. And there are not only driveway connections to and from the alley, but there are sidewalks as well. Okay, so we get into the meat of the matter. The the city code has Three, three different sections related to streets and sidewalks. And they are not necessarily consistent. So section 102.21 provides for the minimum right of way with access easements and title to streets. And on this one, you'll see for alleys, the minimum is 16 feet. This is, this section of code was adopted in March of 1981. It's a very old section of code. The next section, that you're going to see some reference to is under 102.22. Let's see, there it is. And that also refers to 16 feet for alleys as far as minimum paving widths adopted it in the same year at the same time. The more relevant and the most current um, set of regulations is within the LDRs. That's section 6.1.2. And that's the new standard, which is 20 feet for alleys. So in the case, in, in the case of the T, or T less a leg, um, neither the east-west or the north-south alley meets the code. So in order for it to be compliant, additional right-of-way dedications would be recur, um, required in the event that this site was to be de redeveloped. And Brian's talked a little about, bit about that in the report, and I'm not going to, because it's not really germane to, to our topic. So this is what sits on the lot today, which, which I had shown you in red, which it, the alley on paper is wrapped around. Um, it is called the hut, known as the hut. It's a Quonset hut. My client has acquired this property and intends to um, rehabilitate the site uh, because it is distressed. Um, everything around it is distressed, and inside it is also distressed, and locate his office in this particular facility. That's the ultimate plan. Um, So there are two sections of the code that speak to the criteria that we need, need to comply to, you know, in order to obtain a waiver, we must meet this criteria. The first section is 2.4.7B5, and it has four parts. The first part is that it shall not adversely affect the neighboring area, and your staff's reviewed it thoroughly, as have we in our, in our initial request and in his backup. Shall not significantly diminish the provision of public facilities, shall not create an unsafe condition, and does not result in the grant of a special privilege, in that the same waiver would be granted under similar circumstances on a property for another applicant. So now we'll get into them specifically. Under A, um, the waiver will not adversely affect the neighboring area. Um, the unimproved portion, uh, the, the alley is not in use today. Not the entire alley, but the portion of the alley that is contiguous to this property was never constructed, as you can see. There are, the city put up the red um, diamond signs to obviously demonstrate that it's a dead end. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a meeting that occurred when there was a discussion about paving roads and alleys within Osceola Park because this section of this alley was actually discussed, and I'll get into that a little bit in, in some detail. But the current alleys, as I mentioned, are non-conforming on paper. One is 16 feet, the other is 12 feet wide. The minimum for both of them would be 20. And because this particular building on this particular lot meets the minimum standards, it's barely meeting the minimum standards. It barely meets the minimum lot standards. On the south side, the building is on the setback line. On the alley side, on the rear side, it is between one and one and a half feet from the alley. There is no room to give an inch. Forget about four feet or eight feet in the case of the east-west. So 
in fact, this waiver certainly wouldn't be adverse, but it, it would be adverse to try to develop those alleys in this configuration because there is no room for it. And it, it would function improperly. And our traffic engineer is going to talk a little bit about that, so I'll skip over that part. So the current alleys are non-conforming. Improving the alleys would have a more adverse um, impact on the surrounding area for the following reasons. The existing building, again, is located on the property line. It's the, the lot, the block itself is tra trapezoidal in shape, and it dead ends into a shopping center parcel that is built right on the property line. So that alley cannot go through to second, and it is very close to a shopping center, a, a commercial use, that has no parking. So there are some massive visibility issues that Brian will get into. So we have an odd-shaped block. Um, it's contrary to the intention of the surrounding property owners. And by that, and I'm going to show you some pictures, this alley, while it was built by the city, and it's in good condition as far as the asphalt itself, it is, it is fenced off by every single lot owner on this block. Um, there are only two parcels that are using it, and they're only using it for pedestrian access. They have pedestrian gates that do open and allow access into the alley or across the alley. And while I happened to be there taking pictures, um, one of the neighbors came out of his lot through the pedestrian gate, walked over to go to the commercial center to buy something. So it is not being used for vehicular traffic, which is really the intent of the alley to get deliveries and some of those not as pleasant uses behind properties. In this instance, these owners are not using it. So certainly are not finishing it would not be adverse to their wishes because they don't want to use it. Right. So as I mentioned before, the, this is the existing building. And this perspective is, look, is on the rear side of the property. Um, you are looking at the CRA site that side of the property it is built on the zero setback line so there is no room there the the back of the property has between one and uh, to 1.5 so there's no room in the back to let that alley expand to a condition that is more suitable for a vehicular particularly box trucks and delivery trucks um, and there's also a concrete creep pad that you can't see in this picture that is on the rear of the property that you would have to remove and most importantly, and I'll show you that, there is a light pole that is in the alley. Um, and, I, and I'll explain why. One of the reasons why this area and this section was not um, paved was because the cost of relocating that would be so great that it didn't make sense, number one. And number two, there was nowhere to put it because the properties around it are mostly zero setback. So I think that kind of covers that one. All right, um, I, I just started talking about this meeting where paving the alleys was discussed. It happened to be on May 3rd in 2016. It was at the then City Commission meeting. Um, this, what you're looking at, is a map of the improvement plan showing those streets and alleys that were intended for milling and resurfacing, those that were intended for paving, and those that were intended for repaving. Um, in this instance, this was the only part of the alley system that the commission um, agreed should not be paved, and hence why the rest of the alley did get paved and this one had been left out. Um, so, and, and during their discussion, they concluded the following, and we have minutes, and so I'm just kind of transcribing minutes here, but one, it made more sense to route the traffic through the CRA lot because it is more of a midpoint between Southeast 2nd Street and Southeast 3rd Street. Um, two, it's cheaper to route the traffic through the CRA, and that relates to trying to relocate a, a major um, light pole and major lines, and that, it, that they agreed that it did not benefit the alley. They didn't see benefit in paving it all the way through, going all the way down to, to and through the T. They supported the elimination of two parking spaces on the CRA parcel um, to flow through the CRA lot. They also um, created some spaces in the event that you did overshoot the CRA lot, which would be kind of hard to do, but maybe at nighttime, there were spaces where you could just back out and turn around. 
um, and they recognized that the alley functioned perfectly well through the CRA and accepted that functionality. So the existing block conditions. This is the um, block, so to speak. Uh, you can see the little white building on the uh, upper left-hand side is the hut, what I referenced the hut, and you can see the, the um, L configuration. So the dash red line um, is the fencing that is existing throughout this portion of the block. As you can see on the east side, it runs along the entire expanse, and then it wraps around the property owner on the north side of the site has fenced off his property or her property. Um, and, it, and it is fenced all the way up to the CRA property, where you do not see the fence is where the CRA is. And there is no fence on the hut, which would be kind of challenging since there's only a foot to a foot and a half there anyway. So that's the red line. The blue is where the pedestrian gates are. And there, as I mentioned, are two. But you don't see the second one, but there is a second one. And then there, um, where the yellow is, are bollards. And I'm going to show you that picture, too. Um, one of the buildings along this alley ha was right on the alley. <laughs> I mean, it's, you can't miss it. And it, it is dangerous. And there are windows in that building as well. So uh, when the alley was paved, bollards were installed. They actually step into the alley between a foot to two feet to protect the building, which is a bit of a unique condition. I can't say I've ever seen one anywhere else, but maybe it's possible. But um, so, you know, the, the neighborhood has recognized the challenges. Um, and the commission recognized the challenges when they chose not to pave it um, and chose not to move that, that light pole. Um, and so that's primarily why we're here, but we'll uh, skip on through. So there's that pole, not a little one. And in addition to the pole itself, and that is, by the way, in the alley, um, there's also a guy wire that extends down. So um, I'm not sure where it would have gone, uh, short of having to take property from someone to put it somewhere if they had chosen to actually pave this section. So uh, let me switch back, sorry. So applicant intends to, pro and so the next waiver condition, um, the waiver will not significantly diminish the provision of public facilities. Uh, the client has al already acknowledged that they'll provide any easements necessary for the prov provision of utilities. Uh, we talked about the existing light pole within the 16-foot alley, makes the expansion not just problematic, but pretty much impossible. Um, your staff so far on A and B has recognized that there are no issues with these two waiver requests as far as A and B. Uh, next one, C, the waiver will not create an unsafe condition. Improving, uh, improving this alley, it is, it is our position that it would create an unsafe condition, and the traffic engineer is going to talk about that. Um, it also um, is incredibly problematic for the property itself because we have a 2,400 square foot lot. The minimum requirement in this part of, in this zoning is 2,000. If we had to dedicate the additional eight on the east-west and an additional four on the north-south, we would then get under the minimum lot requirement, which, which if this building ever blew down or knocked down, would essentially make this parcel worthless. So, so this is not a condition that is an easy one to deal with. And it's hard enough under the existing conditions, but with the prospect of having to build that alley, it makes it virtually impossible. Um, if we didn't do the 12 foot and did the 16 as an example, that would result in a dead end condition. The way that the city, um, and it was very thoughtful uh, in their, their discussion, figured out how to handle it. They planned for what is there today and they thought it was adequate, and we, we happen to agree with them. And it works very well under the circumstances. Um, and again, the 12-foot alley, the, one other consideration, where the 12-foot alley would come out, which is just on the left side of that building, is very close to, as I mentioned, a building and a use that has no parking. And there are perpendicular car, cars parked perpendicularly in front of that building. And so visibility is very difficult coming out of that location if it did exist, and it is so much closer to Southeast 2nd Street and the intersection between the tracks and 2nd. 
that was a consideration when they looked at whether they should um, pave it. Staff also found that it did not create an unsafe condition, so found us compliant with the waiver um, number C. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and he's going to explain why, if you did try to pave this, it would make conditions less safe than they are today. If you could just state your name and address for the record. And were you here when you were swearing in? I was. I have been sworn in. For the record, Brian Kelly, traffic engineer with Simmons and White, 2581 Metro Center Boulevard, West Palm Beach. So what I have in front, front of you right now is what we call an auto turn analysis. So whenever we do a design um, for any kind of maneuverability, we actually have software that we can actually track vehicles of different sizes, different dimensions, and track them through a site to see, okay, what kind of conflicts are there going to be? What are their turning radius based on their size and the parameters that we're, we're aware of? So what we're showing right here is a 24-foot box truck, which actually isn't even a huge box truck. It's actually kind of a little bit on the smaller side. Um, and there's kind of four different scenarios here. And the, the top left one is the scenario of coming from the alley, uh, making a left turn, and then a right turn onto Southeast Second Avenue. Um, so I'm gonna kind of describe the scenarios and I'll explain the issues in a second. The upper right is um, coming from the alley, once again, making a left turn onto the 12 foot alley, then making another left turn onto Southeast Second Avenue. Bottom left is coming northbound on Southeast Second Avenue, making a right turn to the 12 foot alley and then another right turn onto the 16 foot alley. Bottom right hand on your screen is coming from the north side going southbound on Southeast Second Avenue, making a left turn onto the 12 foot alley, then a right turn onto the 16 foot alley. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip over the turning movements on Second Avenue because I want to get to that in a minute on a different slide, uh, but there are some particular issues with that. But the, the main point I want to draw from these slides, if you look at the corner of the 16-foot alley and the 12-foot alley on any of these particular scenarios, simply the box truck cannot make that maneuver. Um, there's no radius. You're talking about a T, or in this case, actually the L that we're referring to, and you're either going from a 12-foot section to a 16-foot section or vice versa. And you simply cannot make that turn without impeding uh, and going over the right of way under um, any of these scenarios, there will always be a corner clip there uh, without an actual radius. So that's probably why there is the requirement for the 20 foot alley. And that's why you can actually make those maneuvers when you have a wider uh, pavement area. But a 12 foot section and a 16 foot section, it's just simply not going to work. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. I'll kind of go through this kind of quickly as well. So these are the same type of scenarios, but this is a regular passenger vehicle. So this is a regular car, not a box truck. So if you kind of look through them, um, a regular passenger vehicle can barely make most of these maneuvers, but it's extremely tight. So they got to do a really good draw, really good job um, making these turns. But once again, that is a reason it's not designed um, a 12 foot and a 16 foot alley is not designed for these type of vehicle maneuverabilities because it's just, it's very, very tight. Um, so that's the, the regular uh, standard vehicle and you can see them kind of going over and then on Southeast second, you may be impeding onto another lane um, um, as you're turning. But here's where, um, what I want to focus on here. Um, I want to go over some of these pro uh, traffic impacts. So the proximity of the east-west alley to Southeast Second Street would impact queuing on Southeast Second Avenue and Southeast Second Street as previously recognized by the mayor. Um, obviously a 16-foot alley and a 12-foot alley is not suitable for two-way traffic. At best, it's, it's one-way traffic. Line of sight issues. So this is a big one. So line of sight with the parking on the north side, and Bonnie kind of mentioned that. So if you look on the screen here, we have about 130 feet um, from the alley to Southeast Second Street. So if you are on that alley, I want you to kind of picture yourself trying to, you're coming up on the alley trying to turn left onto Second Southeast Second Avenue. There is a whole row of vehicles that are immediately to your right. So if you're looking to make a left turn, all, any parked vehicle, particularly within those first three or four spaces, are blocking your vision. So the FDOT and the, uh, the FDOT Green Book, the engineering requirements for line of sight is over 300 feet for, um, for what it would be to make a left turn uh, from the alley to Southeast Second Avenue. We only have 130 feet there. So what that means is there is a lot of blockage from those um, uh, 
parked vehicles. But secondly, as well, any kind of queued vehicles. So if there's queued vehicles in the northbound direction on Southeast Second waiting to uh, on Southeast Second Street, two or three vehicles there, that's also blocking your vision from any cars turning in the southbound direction from Second Street onto Second Avenue that you can't see if you're trying to make a left turn. So this the even if you have the 12 foot alley there, even if you're able to make those maneuvers, it's actually an unsafe condition to then turn onto Southeast Second Avenue because you don't meet line of sight it, um, uh, concerns. And so the, having the access to the CRA is further away and makes it actually a much safer condition than being so close to Southeast Second Street. Uh, and, and kind of the final point here is the existing buildings uh, kind of encroach into the clear zone. I think kind of Bonnie covered that with how close those things are. So that does create another safety potential issue um, with that proximity. So um, that kind of concludes my part. I'm gonna turn this back over to, to Bonnie. I'm gonna take just a second here to interrupt. Um, we do have a 20 minute cap on presentations, but I'm gonna give you the um, we're, we're just to done. continue. And, I, and I'll skip over. Um, that one yours, is yours. No worries, I I, this I'm mine. giving you the time that you need. Thank so. you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll cut it quickly here. We went through the bulk of it. Um, so uh, we really talked about this. Um, so current dead end is absorbed by the use of the CRA lot, yes. So in staff's report, it's talked a little bit, and yet, you know, the reason why the code was changed to try to eliminate or at least curb the, the number of waivers um, was based on so many, or the number of abandonments, was based on so many abandonments that were coming in and that were granted leaving disconnected and non-functioning alley system. And alley systems are important under the right circumstances in the right place. Um, and so I just want to show you a little bit about the history. So. This is a, a um, map of the town of Linton, and I'm going to, by the way, hit the last waiver um, for at least one section. Map, it's called the Map of the Town of Linton, Florida. It was dated 1896. And while there are a lot of alleys shown on this map, it, I, ironically and interestingly, you'll find that pretty much everything that ran along the alley did not have, uh, ran around, pardon me, ran along the railroad tracks did not have an alley system. Understanding that those were going to be uses that were more, that you would more expect near an, a, a railroad. So 100 years ago, it wasn't shown on our parcel or on our, our block. We're not asking to, to abandon something that had been established so many years ago with something that was done later. Um, so let me see. Um, and. And, and what I also wanted to show was some of the um, blocks that have either abandoned all or portions of their alleys, and they're shown in red, and you're going to see a lot of them. Okay, and so then blocks with no alley systems, also a lot. This is in the north part of, of the CBD blocks with broken alley systems. We'll see many of those. So we're not asking to do something that hasn't been done. We're not asking for a special privilege or to set a precedent that you haven't seen before. Oops, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead of that. Um, and then lastly, and I won't go into each and every one of these because your staff report has, and I think we've, your staff has recognized that we are not inconsistent with them. But because we're in the CBD, there's another section that would also apply. This is criteria that you must consider. Um, it's section 4.4.13 K5B2. It does not result in an inferior pedestrian experience. It will not allow the creation of significant incompatibilities with nearby buildings. It will not erode the connectivity of the street and sidewalk network or negatively impact the bike pedestrian master plan and that it won't reduce the quality of civic open spaces. And I'm going to try to get through them very quickly. Um, under A, uh, in, uh, will not result in an inferior pedestrian um, experience. It's not located adjacent to a street that would directly impact the characteristics of that street. So your staff has recognized that they didn't view this as being a, a, a problem. Um, 
All right. The next section, the waiver will not allow the creation of significant incompatibilities with nearby buildings or uses of land. As a matter of fact, our neighbors aren't using the alley other than for pedestrian. Um, and only in two cases. And by the way, we provided two letters to you that we received, one from James Quillian and the other from Dorcas Lucian, who, by the way, owns the lot just to the south of the, of the CRA lot. And her, one of her comments, she mentions that she doesn't really see the benefit of the alley personally, her, her, her lot and her business, and they're not using it. So we don't, we don't believe that we're creating any incompatibility with what we're proposing nor did the City Commission when they looked at using the CRA as the cut through. All right, and um, let's see. I think I'm, I've kind of covered this with the others. Um, the waiver will not allow, uh, let's just, excuse me for just a minute, I'm trying to, uh, um, I, I talked about existing conditions with the fence and the bollards. Um, properties adjacent have not, um, have, have, sought not to use it um, and again your staff says that it, they do not anticipate uh, that we've created significant incompatibilities under that section all right and so here's the bollard picture i thought that that would be relevant and here's the, an example of the fence as you can see looking down you see and they aren't just you know necessarily chain link fences they're solid fences so so in this instance because one side of this alley is non-residential and the other is primarily residential, you know, this has made the most sense to separate the uses and that's how our neighbors have separated their uses. Um, and then the waiver will not erode the connectivity. Um, this alley does not currently provide connectivity. Um, the alley cannot be improved because of the, the location of the building placement, the, the existing sizes. And as Brian mentioned, the potentially unsafe conditions that would be created if these alleys had been paved. Um, we talked about the uh, Osceola Park paving plan. The City Commission recognized that. Um, and they concluded that it did not make sense to pave that T, T portion, and they did not. And the rest was paved. Um, and then lastly, uh, the waiver will not reduce the quality of civic open space. This is not because of the size of the site, uh, civic space isn't required here. So this is not applicable. So I think, and again, your staff recognize that. So I think we have met all the criteria and, and to try to make these alleys function properly would be detrimental to a lot of things. Um, we talked about safety, pedestrian, vehicular, but also that lot would become non-conforming if it had to contribute one square foot into the alley system. So thank you very much for giving me extra time. I appreciate it. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Ryan Rucher, Transportation Planner for the City of Delray Beach, for the record. Um, thank you. You've had a presentation from Ms. Miskell. Um, she went through a lot of the, obviously, the geography and background, so I'm going to provide a little bit additional context in my presentation. Um, this is for the waiver to the abandonment of right-of-way within the Central Business District. As Bonnie described, the LDRs currently allow them, but there is an extra step through the process of a waiver to be processed. This is a simil similar procedure to the request that was uh, made last month, so I'm not going to go into full detail on that. Um, with respect to the uh, property, Bonnie also covered the previously abandoned alley. This used to be a T alley, now it's an inverted L. The requested for aban area requested for the abandonment is this shape behind lot five. Um, it sits between lot one and five of the block 87 of Lynn's addition to Osceola Park Platte of the city of Delray Beach. Lots, um, you'll have to excuse me, I have it on another slide, but I'll go through the how this lot over here is cre was created and incorporated. Um, generally, it's a commercial core, central business district, railroad corridor sub-district. The alley, of course, is unimproved. You've seen pictures of that. There are um, overhead utility lines in the right of way, in the alley right of way, as well as underground utilities also located within the right of way. And the request, of course, is to abandon. So, as I had said before, 
Um, this, these parcels up here um, have all been combined, 2 through 4 and 15, to create one larger lot. Uh, the area shaded in blue is about 1,600 square feet, give or take, of a uh, portion of the alley that was already abandoned. When it was abandoned, the property was returned to the heir's successors and assigned, split evenly. Since this lot has been all combined, it does not matter. In the instance that this uh, uh, alley abandonment would pro proceed, the alley would be split into three separate properties and returned equally to the prop properties of lot one, lot five, and lot 15. So uh, I believe, if I may state, that the applicant also uh, owns lot, what was formerly lot two through four and 15, lot five, and then lot one is owned by a separate owner. Um, just a little bit of background into going into the project. In 2002, our downtown master plan recognized that Alleys are very important to the city, not just for this generation. You know, we hear a lot about what's happening today, what's going on today, who owns property today, who thinks that this should be done because it currently benefits the current owners. Well, the downtown master plan enshrines that future generations um, might find it very hard, um, the decisions that have been made in the past based off of our alley system and our street system. The, the reason that we have a, a specific number of rules and that we have this extra layer is because we have a number of policies and procedures in place which either prohibit or strongly discourage the abandonment of alleys and streets. So that, was, that goes back to 2002 and it runs all the way through our comprehensive plan which was adopted recently. More specifically with respect to this alley, in 2016, the city and the CRA entered into a project to improve the area. They provided on-street parking um, along Southeast 2nd Avenue, um, a parking lot located immediately to the south of Lot 5, and the paving of the alley. As um, Bonnie mentioned, there was a direction from the city commission at that time to give direction to the public works staff on the bid for what that alley paving project should look like. City Commission directed staff to leave that alley out um, due to feedback from the community. Specifically, they did not um, uh, see purpose and need to pave the alley at that time. That direction didn't obviously come with direction on abandonments in particular, but there were large concerns about um, east and west vehicular traffic entering into the Osceola Park neighborhood at, that, at the time of that action not necessarily because the alley shouldn't exist. Um, that follows with a 27, oops, 2017, um, excuse me, I went over the 2017 abandonment. Uh, there was the abandonment that obviously occurred in 2019, um, and then of relevance, the Osceola Park Neighborhood Redevelopment Plan update was adopted February 11th by the commission. Some pictures of the site. Uh, looking northeast from the two parking spaces, these are all um, of the area Bonnie has showed you either some variation or direction of these, so I'm just going to quickly give you a, a couple of different perspectives um, for the record. As discussed um, in Ms. Miskell's presentation, the applicant's presentation, there are rules in place that uh, streets and alleys may not be vacated or closed to accommodate a, a new development. Um, but in addition to that, alleys may be re relocated, provided that access and service is maintained to all properties, and the reconfigured alley maintains public access and at least two access points. We'll get into that um, in a bit. Um, the applicant's presentation included a summary of these findings, so I'm not going to read this text to you. We'll go through them in more specifics. Before I do that, I just want to also reiterate to the board that abandonments are not necessary to facilitate redevelopment in the city of Delray Beach. We have a number of alleys which, while they are not necessarily a 12 and 12 foot and 16 foot wide T alleys, they do receive dedications over time as redevelopment does occur to bring them up to city standard, which has evolved over time to facilitate redevelopment, one, and also contribute to the form and function of the city of Delray Beach. On the screen, you see obviously a number of redevelopments which have occurred. Um, the one on the right in particular is AT Alley, uh, Block 93, the Delray Beach Market, has a mixture of commercial uses facing Atlantic Avenue, not immediately adjacent to the railroad property, but nevertheless still holds true, has the alley, and is functioning quite well. So um, with, with regards to this alley specifically, um, 
I think it's important to recognize, or the city is called out in its staff report is in particular a number of effects, particularly on neighboring, neighboring area, increased density in the erosion of the street network. We have these policies in place for a reason. Now, if let's say the abandonment does go through, there would still be access retained through the alley as uh, has been present has been discussed. Um, this is not a city owned parking lot. This is a CRA parking lot. And I draw that distinction in importance because the city currently does not have control over this alley. This, I mean, with respect to this alley, we have asked the CRA for comments. They did not provide comments specifically for this. They do not have a neighborhood plan, which specifically calls out this alley uh, parking area. Um, I, I, there's just no position that they could take which would reasonably decide what the city should do with respect to its alleys. So that is an additional component. We might be in potentially affecting the neighboring area because we could be effectively restricting the access of this street um, or this alley connection outwards to make it in perpetuity the future alley connection. Um, as discussed in the staff report, there is um, potential for increased density, intensity, lot coverage. As I had stated previously, the lot to the rear of the applicant site for the hut would receive property as well. And we have received calls about the redevelopment of this parcel in particular and whether or not they would be required to dedicate or not. So we understand that while the, the request is from this property, it does impact the surrounding area and it does impact the surrounding neighborhoods. So the board has to take that into consideration um, at its deliberations. Uh, we have a number of tea alleys in the city, which I wanted to just point out, draw attention to. Yes, there are obviously control issues with respect to how tight the alley would be for larger delivery and larger service vehicles. However, as we redevelop as a community, we find that some of these alleys are still functioning quite well and some of them are still providing access to delivery services. They're being de dedications are received as development improves the city and improves areas. And um, we see that even larger developments are able to utilize loading areas to the rear. So pictured here is Delray Beach Market. They have loading zones to the back. Obviously this, air, this alley is improved to a certain standard, but if we abandon alleys, we will not receive this type of services being located in those areas. Some examples of the potential impacts. Um, you have seen this slide before previously, so I won't go into too much detail, but if we continue to abandon areas and in allow increased density intensity and uses, there could be potential conflict. Um, one area in particular uh, is the alley behind Worthing Place, which is only partially abandoned, where employees compete for loading space with, um, with uh, employees are, where employees are competing for loading space. Um, the alley is obviously not providing ample su enough supply because there's still loading going on on the street. Um, and then obvious trash collection issues. Um, and in terms of density and intensity, um, I can't remember the last time someone came to me and said that they want bigger buildings in Delray Beach. That's, it just, it boils down to that with respect to density and intensity, which could potentially be increased if this uh, abandonment occurs. So while the alley has not been currently impaved, that does not mean it necessarily would not be improved in the future. The city does have utilities located in the uh, right of way, as I said, above ground and underground. The applicant has willing, willingly stated that they would provide easements for those services. However, because there is a subsurface sewer, um, there could not be any buildings placed over the alley right of way unless those, ser unless those uh, services were relocated. So in summary, um, we have discussed at length um, that there are not necessarily a lot of direct impacts to the community as summarized in the staff report as given in the presentation. However, when it comes down to uh, special privilege and when it comes down to potentially creating incompatibilities with the surrounding area, eroding the connectivity of the street and sidewalk network, some of the things that we really don't believe as um, a city could potentially impact the area. Are we going to enable this as a board? Um, more specifically, um, 
the LHL, there is a policy in our comprehensive plan. Uh, we've gone through this before, but also I won't read all of them, but the one I would like to draw your attention to is MBL 262, which states that the city shall maintain the existing network of alleys in the downtown, which provide multiple benefits that enhance the quality of the area, and there are sub-bullets associated with them that are provided in the staff report. So uh, with that being said, the, op the options before the board are presented on the screen. Um, a, B, C, D, and uh, are also provided in the staff report, and I'm available for questions at your leisure, as well as the applicant. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Um, Mr. Bennett, uh, uh, Mr. Knight coming forward, is he considered part of the applicant? Or we might get some clarification. My understanding that his son is actually the applicant. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And I'll make it very brief, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Um, my name is Jim Knight. I live at 10 Southeast First Avenue. Um, this is an inferior, unimproved lot that's there, the alleyway. Um, there's no trash collection from that alleyway today and won't be there in the future. You saw the bollards that are in there and the buildings that stick into the street. Uh, the neighbors, both businesses and residents uh, support this. And the safest solution is to keep the access going where it's going through the CRA lot. I happened to be out there the other day. I drove it just again the other day. And that's where the people are coming in either direction that are going down. It's typically only vehicles. Um, I happened to be see, uh, to see a van there. There's someone going on into the, uh, came from second went into the CRA parking lot and was sitting right there waiting, so forth. So that's where the uh, use of the area is coming and going from. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Anyone else from the public? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. Ms. Miskell, do you have any additional testimony, rebuttal testimony, or cross-examination? I just have a clarification point, if I may. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think um, just I wanted to clarify the point as to the ownership of the what we're referring to as a CRA lot. Actually, my colleague did speak with with the CRA director to uh, ask them about how they felt about it, and there and what Renee explained to us was that they had turned their the property over to the city, so the city does have control over that lot. So I just wanted to clarify that point. And you know we can we can and talk to Renee between now and right when the, before this goes to commission this yeah, will be we'll, clarified. We'll, but anyway, I we'll thought I'd I'd add that because we did have that conversation with her. Um, and then lastly, you know I, I agree that the city should endeavor to maintain the existing network. The existing network does not include this this area that we're talking about. And if it did, it would be less safe. You know, so th there are lots of instances where alleys have either been abandoned or they were never done. In fact, there's one other alley that is south of here that was never constructed, and during this whole discussion, they elected not to do it. It was within an entirely residential community. It didn't make any sense. It didn't serve any benefit. But in this instance, we presented safety reasons why this shouldn't be uh, um, constructed and impossibility reasons there is an existing light pole there and there is nowhere for it to go uh, and there is a difference in ownership by the way between the east side and the west side of the north south alley i just wanted to clarify that point but otherwise brian did a very thorough um report and thank you very much brian for your help just, just to bonnie's point the the ownership might be different however the returning of parcels could be that the development intensity could potentially increase to the properties to the east regardless of ownership because as i said before it's not just about today properties change hands quite often and development sells so thank you okay. thank you uh, anything thank else you very much for your attention All right brian anything else no rebuttal no cross for me thank you okay uh to the board then dana would you like to start no, Chairman. <laughs> I would not. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll go last. <laughs> John? No, it's, it's uh, a lot of interesting points being brought up here. Um, you know, the assembly potentially of parcels, um, increased density. There is signage on that lot um, that says it's the CRA. Yeah. 
So I, that's one thing I did see. There was a number of signs there that said it was CRA. Um, I saw a lot of the points bringing up reflect to the past. I think with Osceola Park, that area, especially with all the development that's going on, um, we've got multi-million dollar townhomes going in there. We've got all the projects that have been put on Atlantic Avenue, I mean, on, on federal. Um, I think we need to look towards the future, which was brought up of that alley. Will it be needed? Um, you know, the FPNL thing, I, I'm amazed sometimes that we get electricity in Delray Beach. I'm sorry. It's just, you look at my backyard looks like spaghetti, but that one with the moss and everything and where it's positioned, I definitely get the argument on that. Um, it, it just, there, there seems to be, I, I'm trying to look at this forward thinking now with all the development that's going on in there. And, and uh, I know we had Mr. Rosen in here last time we were together and that project, obviously that is a hot zone right now for development. Um, and the alleys do give a lot of character to that area. That particular section, I'm not so sure about, but I think with that one, there could be some concerns with um, a large assemblage and an increase in density. And then what are we gonna have? Are we gonna have another large uh, multifamily development there? How does that fit in with the character of the neighborhood of Osceola Park as Delray uh, morphs very quickly into a whole, I live in Lake Ida and I'm watching it on a daily basis. Um, not the city that I graduated high school from and not the city that um, I, I even moved back to in 2010. It's happening at a breakneck pace. So um, I think there's a lot to consider here. And um, uh, I'm interested to hear everybody else's thoughts on this. Thank you. Ned? So I have a couple of questions for staff. Yes. When underground utilities or um, overhead utilities are moved, who is usually the uh, party that initiates that request? Unless there is a specific reason for the city to move utilities, the city will not move utilities. So if, for whatever reason, um, this abandonment is approved, an easement would be given to the city for the purposes of maintenance. Um, there are underground utilities which would preclude any buildings from going on onto this um, area. Um, and it, uh, that's more or less what would happen if there was ever any development which would impact those facilities, the cost would be borne by the applicant. Okay. My second question then is, if the abandonment, abandonment did in fact happen um, and parts were reverted back to the owners, have you done any kind of calculation of the potential additional impact that would happen per owner? So I, it's, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me. I know that it would be split in kind of a weird trapezoidal uh, configuration to the three properties surrounding. I'm pulling up a picture of the block. Um, How many square feet are we actually approximately talking about per owner? It's the entirety is, I believe, 1,460 square feet for the entire alley. It wouldn't exactly be split equally between the three properties. Um, the property, uh, let's see if I can show, I think this picture probably does a better justice of it. The property, um, it's hard to describe, but I'll do my best. And I wonder if there's a sketch tool that might even allow it a little bit better on this. Do I don't think I need a specific yeah. number. I think it's, I need just a, a, a general idea of it's, it's 0 0.05 acres for the entire alley, so it's a very small amount. Right. Ultimately, the configuration of the block is probably what's more so important in this instance. However, there is some configurations. I mean, development can come in with very small margins when it comes to things like the minimum uh, lot coverage and other factors. So that those are the items that we would look at if, um, if this were to go in, and like I said, it's only 1,460 square feet, but the configuration of the block would also be somewhat sacrificed with, 
as a result of the abandonment, which has already occurred in fairness to the applicant and would require dedications if redevelopment were to occur. Um, and the applicant did agree to any easement access that would be necessary. I think I heard that. Yeah. Um, also, the applicant does understand that they were the undergrounding of the sewer, no development could happen over that, comp that particular area, right? Under your code today and your regulations say that yes, that is correct. They could also relocate the utilities if it, if it were pertinent to the development to make it successful. At their expense. I think. At their expense. And the uh, easement would then be abandoned and an easement would cre be created for other purposes for the utility providers, for example. I, I think where um, legal counsel was, was very helpful in the last case that came in front of us is to ask us to really compartmentalize this, this decision. Um, and so I think whether it is um, improved, unimproved, the conditions currently is inconsequential to our decision. Uh, I think, however, there are enough mitigating um, concerns about the use and the Im future and improvements and such uh, that it warrants us just let it getting considered through the process. Um, that and that's just my thought in terms of utilities and and such. So. Thank you, Carol. Okay, I, I think that the alley, the way it functions now, I believe um, it will function the same way if it were abandoned. Um, they have, I mean, the city has already stopped it and not continued, not, not wanted to continue on to the L shape. And then you have the CRA lot, which essentially acts as the way the alley was intended to act. It's just basically a block before. And all these things were already thought out. I mean, decisions have already been made here. So it, no matter what, it still functions as an alley. And the only, and, and the part that doesn't function is a part that's not there anyway. Um, just to, so, I mean, for that reason, I've, I'm in favor. I think it's a reasonable request. Um, and I don't think the connectivity is eroded. Um, I don't think the use of the alley is eroded. Um, um, that's oh and also so if they split this they split down the middle it would be split between three parcels but, but is the line in the middle of the alley like the yeah there would line? be a line going through the middle of the alley and down okay and then the property to the north would receive a portion the property to the east would receive a portion and the property to the west would receive a portion right so the property to the north that would actually benefit there they could get a little landscape strip no matter how i don't know how big it would be how big's that alley now that That's that alley is 12. 12 yeah right, so 12 it would feet. be six and six they're gonna get six feet and then they can actually improve that um you know their parking area they could put in a landscape island and a tree <laughs> and stuff but um yeah they could provide some more green mm -hmm. there and the other owner would or that other owner would have to provide your client would have to provide the five foot green space also right so i'll it, that depends on the nature of the application that comes in at that time you know it, it, it ultimately the if the waiver is approved it would go to the commission and then if the commission approves the waiver Planning and Zoning Board would have a different set of findings on the nature of the abandonment to, 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 to consider. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, there are questions about site plan applications. Those are entirely different, <laughs> and I think probably a little bit too far down the road for us to consider and make a decision on, but they will be obviously analyzed against the code for whenever they come in. Okay, thank you. That's it. Steven? Yeah. Uh, well, I kind of agree with the club that this really isn't an alley. It's, it's kind of an abandoned little strip. Um, there's, uh, so, uh, but I am wondering the part to the north of the hut, what is, is that, that's paved right now? 
That was paved. Um, actually, this picture in the north, uh, the upper right section of the screen provides a good picture of that. Yes, it was. I believe it was improved um, by the property owner of the hut at one point. Um, it currently sits vacant as pictured in both the applicants and staff's presentation uh, as unimproved. Okay. So, okay. But does, does the alley go all the way through where those cars are as well? No, yeah. So the owner of that property, and I believe it was a previous owner, actually fenced in that northern part of the alley and had items stored there and there was a code case which had been resolved through compliance. So that pavement you see um, on the north side of the building was acting in essence as his parking lot or storage area. It was not, um, an, it was not improved alley in the sense that the alley going north-south was improved. And this condition, as I've depicted and Mr. Bennett indicated, has been improved since it's it's cleared and there's a new property owner who is taking better care of the property. And for clarity purposes, that side yard is part alley and part yard. 12 feet of it is alley and the balance of it is a side yard. Okay, and so yeah, stay on this picture. So the, below there, that's CRA. I, I believe that we've had a back and forth. I, I did look at the property appraiser's website, which still listed as the CRA, um, but we will confirm that that's for the benefit of the district. Um, it was created with, in addition to the on-street parking, which is depicted on the opposite side of the street, all as one project. Um, it, it's for the benefit of the property owners, residents, et cetera, along that area. Correct. 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 Interesting. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm also wondering what kind of precedent this sets. I mean, if we allow the here. So I, I say this <laughs> every meeting, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Um, but just really, I, I would advise the board to just put the idea of precedence out of your mind. Generally speaking, property is so unique and each application stands on its own that you're never going to have an identical situation. Um, you know, and, yeah, and in this, in this particular instance, I mean, you actually have um, city commission discussion from the past about that improvement. There are physical signs. Um, prohibiting vehicular access, those things, neither applicant or the city have provided a even similar circumstance. So this wouldn't be precedent setting. This is, you know, very fact specific and for this property only. Thank you. Steven, anything else? Uh, no. All right. Price, I noticed you had some notes. <laughs> yeah, I always have notes. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I've, I've been on the record many times as being uh, inalterably opposed to uh, abandonment of, of streets and, and alleys. Um, abandonment has led to some of the largest uh, um, projects in our town on, on which this applicant worked. Um, this, to me, is is uh, is different. The um, the alley, is, all the other projects that were, first of all, neighbors were complaining about all the other projects. The applicant owned properties on either side of the alley. So it was to his immediate benefit or her immediate benefit to get the get the uh, alley abandoned so that they could expand. In all instances, it led to more dense development. This is a, an entirely different um, situation. Um, I've, I've driven the alley a couple times. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that the guy actually got all those bollards in front of his house. I mean, it's, it's, he's got like 16 bollards. There's no way you could uh, hit his house. Um, <laughs> But, but the alley still service, it, it's, it's functional, it's, it's not serviceable, it's not, you know, you couldn't get a garbage truck down there, so you can't pick up the garbage, you can't do anything like that. There's a perfectly serviceable um, alley that's been improved uh, one block east, so the, the, um, the, the circulation of the neighborhood is not affected. Um, you know, it's, uh, and, then, and then the other one we, you know, just, just last week, I think we're talking about this applicant's gonna, gonna get it in a whopping 700 square feet of space um 
and and he's still on a on a, on a lot that's that's, that's that's really limited in, in size anyway. If he goes out and starts buying property next to him and stuff, it, it could be to his advantage. But he's he's investing in a, in a neighborhood that I think would need um, investment. Uh, so uh, all that said, I'm I'm in support of this. I think this is was a good dry run for what you're going to have to go through with P and Z because ultimately. They're the ones who make the decision of the abandonment. We're just making a recommendation that the city technically commission. city commission, but yes. Yeah. So tonight, the only thing this board is we're providing recommendation is whether waiver. an abandonment right. should be allowed for, in essence, development. So right. that's really the only question. And then, even though there the, even, the connectivity yeah. and other issues yeah. are right. are going to be similar discussions. Um, yeah, pl planning and zoning will provide a recommendation for abandonment, and then to city commission. Then I just have one quick question for Brian on the, on the, on the recommendations. Um, the, do you, does, does the city support recommendation A or recommendation B? I'm not sure what as amended refers to, which is the only difference between the two. As amended would reflect if the board decides to have any requirements placed onto ah. this. So Thank you. if yeah. there is there any amendments, you would tack it on to the end of amendment uh, motion uh -huh. B. I'm not going to start tacking on LDRs. Thank you. <laughs> Dana, back to you. Well, uh, thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to go last. It was very educational for me to listen to my colleagues. And in general, I am I, I, I hesitate when it comes to abandonments. Um, but having listened to everyone, I, um, I agree. I, I, I'm a little confused about confusion of ownership, <laughs> I have to say. OK. Um, that's. That's somewhat um, sounds rather strange to me, but um, whether it's CRA or city, um, given that it's it's really not useful, I'm in favor of, of approving the um, getting the waiver to go forward. So, I think the interesting comparison to be made here is to the block where the uh, IPIC building sits, where there is an alley that actually dead ends completely into the IPIC property. Um, the only access is through what I believe is actually a private parking lot. So you get an L shape similar to what we have here with the CRA acting as the access to, uh, to a, what becomes an L shaped alleyway. Um, it's functional. I think that alley is actually wider than this one. I think it's probably a 16 foot, um, maybe a little wider even, because I think I, they do do garbage through that one, which wouldn't be possible through this one. Um, and I'm in agreement with, with Price. I think that um, given the totality of the circumstances, this is not losing anything from our connectivity. Uh, I don't think the amount that we're giving up here is enough to really benefit uh, any particular developer or property, adjacent property in any way. And uh, I'm, I think I'm in agreement with this particular instance as well. So having said all that, uh, I'd be willing to entertain a motion. I'll move a recommendation of approval of a request to waive the requirements of LDR section 4.4.13J1C streets and blocks to the city commission to allow the planning and zoning board to consider the partial abandonment of an unimproved portion of a T alley Building approximately 1,496 square feet and located adjacent to 201 and 213 Southeast 2nd Avenue and 206 Southeast 3rd Avenue by the finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and land development regulations. Thank you, Carol. And if I could get a second. Second. Thank you, Dana. Susie <coughs> McGray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Trace Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Ian Post Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Todd LaRue? Yes. Okay, first step done. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, we move on to, I believe it is 8F. Hi there. 8F meaning 1236 George Bush Boulevard? Yes. So staff wanted to ask if we could um, reverse the last two since one of them is um, a class one site plan modification and the um, applicant is here now. Okay. If that's if that's okay with the board. Yep, yep, so okay. let's move, that was originally uh, B, B, correct? Mm-hmm. So we'll move that one up uh, and uh, 
we need to actually do a formal vote on that. Let's do a motion to amend the agenda to make item 8H, now 8F, and 8F, 8G, since 8G was switched back, back to 8B. <laughs> so if a board member would like to just say so moved, so I moved. think that will work. I think so Dana said so moved first, uh, second. I will take Price as the second on that. Michelle, you got all that? I have 8H was moved to 8F, and 8F is now G. G, correct? Yep. And a quick call of the roll when you're ready. I now have it. <laughs> okay, um, Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Grace Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana post -Adler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Todd LaRue? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on with item 8F, which is uh, 90 North Congress Ave. Okay, hello again. Welcome back, Mr. Crothers. Octavius Crothers, Assistant Planner, City of Dory Beach. Uh, here presenting Dory Tire and Auto Shop, 90 North Congress Avenue, Class 1, Site Plan Modification. Uh, item 2022-157. Any ex parte communication on this item? No. Nope. No. All right. Mr. Day, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, your address, and the floor is yours. And I do have to swear him in. Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Don't forget, please raise your right hand. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I am Don Day from Delray Awning at 80 North Congress. And this project uh, is an existing uh, tire store auto repair shop. And it actually has a new ownership. And so we, I am here to change the existing awning that's on uh, the front building to from red to this. Uh, almond color and it also has a rear building where the service is done the front building is basically the office and that the rear building when the service is done and he would like to add awnings over all the doors the garage doors and entrance doors to the building uh, it's just a basically flat elevation building, no mats, there's nothing on it, so I think the awnings will help improve the look of it, besides giving him some rain and sun protection from inside the building where they do the work. Uh, so there's nine new door awnings with uh, the replacement of the existing front. Uh, basically, I guess you'd say it's a storefront. I know at one time it was, was for that purpose. And just a little color drawing, Congress here, the existing awning, the back building here with the blue. Okay. But yeah, that's pretty much it. We need to enter that formally into the record or? I think those images are actually um, part of staff's presentation but just an abundance of caution we'll we'll double check and take a copy if we need to okay thank you all right and mr crothers for the city okay again this is Derry tire and auto shop 90 north congress avenue uh, class one site plan modification um, as mr day said we changing of awning material to the office building and installation of eight fabric awnings to the auto repair shop in the rear Okay, here we have an aerial photo of the uh, subject site. The zoning is mixed industrial and commercial. You have adjacent zoning to the north, community facilities to the south, special activities district to the east and to the west, mixed industrial and commercial. 
Uh, here we have the current conditions of the office building. As you can see, the, um, the blue awning on the office building. And to the rear is the auto repair shop. Uh, here we have the proposed uh, color sample and material for the the awnings that will go on the office building as well as the auto repair shop. Um, if I could enter this item into the record. Uh, so it's a patio champagne color for the awning. Comes up with these color names. Uh, here we have some before and afters um, to the left existing and on the right the proposed awning change. Uh, this is just another look at it. Um, the proposed awning will be the same size as the one that is currently existing, um, just a color and material change. And there we have some before and afters of the auto repair shop. To the left, the existing. To the right, proposed with the awnings. Here's another look at it from another angle. And this is the measurements of the awnings that will be going on to the auto repair shop. Um, so the seven awnings that will go over the garage doors are 14 feet wide with a, a projection of four feet. And then the one for the entrance door is four feet wide with a four foot projection as well. And so these modifications can be determined to be in conformity with good taste and good design. And they meet the intent of the objectives of NDC 2.6 and policy NDC 2.6.4. I would ask that uh, you use these required findings. At the time of the action on architectural elevations, the approving board shall make findings with respect to the objectives and standards as contained in the architectural regulations, section 4.6.18. An overall determination of consistency with respect to the above is required in order for an architectural plan to be approved. I have your optional board motions here. And then just a little before and after for you guys. And that will end my presentation. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this item? And seeing and hearing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. Mr. Day, do you have any rebuttal or additional testimony that you want to give? No, I think you did a good job presentating it. OK. And for the city, Mr. Carruthers? No. All right. Dana, you want to start on this one? Looks terrific. Much improved. All right. Price? Same. Steven? Same. Carol? Good. Net? No lettering on the awnings, right? I believe that's correct. No lettering on the awnings? No lettering. Looks great. Thank you. All right. Don? Nothing to add. All right. And I don't really have anything to add either. I think it looks good. I think it's going to look sharp. Let's do it. Ocean? I'll do it. <clears throat> Motion approval of the material change to the existing awning of the office building from blue to patio champagne beige. And the installation of seven awnings above the garage doors and one awning above an entry door to the auto repair shop in the color patio champagne for the property located at 90 North Congress Avenue by finding that the request is consistent with the land development regulations and the comprehensive plan. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you, Dana. Okay. Annette Gray? Yes. Carol Perez? Yes. Mike Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Post-Adler? Yes. Dean Cohen? Yes. John LaRue? Yes. Don, thank you very much. And Chair, just for the record, the applicant is going to provide his presentation board to the secretary, which will add to the file. Okay, thank you. All right, now we are on 8G, if I have that correct now, which is the former 8B. Right? No, former 8F. Is this F. Yes. George Bush? 
Okay. All right. Good evening. Um, 1236 George Bush Boulevard. This is file number 2022014. This is for a class five site plan. And the applicant is here. Thank you. And board members, any ex parte communication on this item? No. 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 Uh, none for me as well. If you could state your name and address for the record, and the uh, floor is yours. Sean McAllister, 900 East Atlantic Ave, Suite 5, uh, Stom Development Group. Um, so I am here on behalf, obviously, the owner and developer of the project. Um, you know, we're really excited to be here in front of you guys today. Um, you know, it was a long process to get here, but we're, we're happy to be here. Um, and, and it was really a great process working with the city and everybody to get kind of where we are now. So... I wanted to give obviously just a brief kind of introduction to you know myself uh, the team and you know we're really looking forward to kind of bringing a special project um, to 1236 George Bush Boulevard which if you recall was the old Parliament Inn um, and I'll keep it very brief for you guys um, just so in that you know I'd like to bring up Carlos Linares um, with Stoft Architects uh, you can kind of walk you through the floor plans and you know a little bit of the design but I just wanted to introduce myself and uh, thank you guys for allowing us to be here today thank you and if you could state your name and address or for the record and then go ahead Carlos Leonidas with uh, Randall Stoft Architects 42 North Swinton Avenue so the project that we're proposing today is a uh, six-unit, uh, three-story townhome uh, at uh, 1236 George Bush Boulevard. Uh, the project consists of, uh, uh, give me one second, uh, c consists of, uh, like I said, three stories. Uh, uh, as you can see, this is the uh, proposed rendering for the, uh, for the project, uh, uh, garage, uh, two-car two garage, um, uh, facing the the, uh, the the street, um, second floor, uh, will have balconies, uh, some decorative uh, fins uh, that we are uh, proposing for the front facade. Uh, up on the third floor, we are proposing uh, a green wall. Um, obviously, the uh, the city of Del Rey. One of the requirements of the city of Del Rey that once we are utilizing the terraces up uh, to a certain uh, size, we have to. Uh, dress it up as a um, um, uh, with with landscape, which we have done. We've worked with staff uh, in order for us to be able to uh, accomplish that. This uh, slide shows the aerial view of the current uh, property and uh, w what the uh, structures that are currently there. Um, this slide shows a uh, an overall site plan. Uh, with the calculations that obviously we've gone through uh, staff uh, to to make sure that we are meeting all the uh, criteria setbacks uh, lot coverage uh, open space um, everything you know that that it, you, the city uh, requires uh, as you can see on the site plan we're showing the uh, driveways the front uh, uh, the driveways to each individual unit uh, out to the back will have uh, each individual unit will have its private uh, pool uh, and yard and a uh, summer kitchen area these are the overall floor plans for uh, this is the first floor second floor we'll, we'll we could uh, get into the uh, uh, enlarged floor plans uh, in the next slides uh, the the we are proposing for this particular uh, project for the uh, condensing units to be up on the rooftop. We are proposing to screen those uh, from the view uh, from the street. Uh, this this is the enlarged uh, floor plan, first floor uh, for the for the units. Uh, the the end units will have the uh, side entry approach. Uh, the inner units, which will be four units, will have the uh, entry through the front. Uh, the first floors are composed of uh, two car garages, uh, a great room kitchen, a foyer, and a uh, the and the uh, the dining area. Uh, obviously, in the back is also the uh, summer kitchen. 
On the second floor is uh, where all the bedrooms will, uh, will be at. Uh, three bedrooms, including the master. Uh, each, individual, each bedroom has its own designated bathroom, uh, utility, and a small transition space that will lead to each individual uh, bedrooms. On the third floor, there is an additional bedroom on the, th on the uh, third floor as well. Uh, it could be used, utilized as a gym. It could be utilized as an office as well. Uh, the end units, uh, due to the uh, stepping back that the uh, city requires, uh, you could see that it's, uh, cre we've created a large uh, terrace uh, with uh, a lot of greenery, um, uh, we've worked with the landscape architect, which, which he's, he's also here if, he, if you have any questions for him as well, uh, in order for us to be able to uh, create that, um, that rooftop terrace uh, with uh, uh, lots of uh, greenery. This slide shows the, uh, the two-dimensional uh, elevations, uh, front elevation, uh, side elevation, and uh, this is the, uh, the, the rear elevation uh, for the, the entire uh, project. Um, we also have some slides for the landscape. I'll, I'll probably just let the uh, landscape architect talk about, and talk about those slides. Um, we also ha um, have some uh, items that we want to also discuss regarding the um, uh, a, a waiver um, that that will also uh, allow for um, Matt or, or the uh, uh, and, and Chris to to talk about that as well. And that pretty much uh, concludes the architectural presentation. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tyler Nielsen with Nielsen Landscape Architects. Our address is 357 Cypress Drive, Jupiter, Florida. So the, the intent for the landscape for 1236 George Bush is to provide a very natural garden for all of the um, different units. So what we're using is a plant palette that consists of native um, shrubs, trees, and then adding in appropriate subtropical plants for texture, tone, and palms to not only soften the architecture, but to provide a nice scale to the building as it sits within the surrounding context. The Trees that we're proposing to use for this property consist of Sip Simpson stopper trees and um, white trumpet trees, the Tababuya hamiensis. Both of these trees are a smaller tree that has a more upright uh, growth that's columnar, um, but they also have a very lacy uh, canopy texture to the foliage. The intent of using these trees is, number one, to ensure that the scale of the tree doesn't uh, grow um, and become problems with not only the proposed architecture, um, but the surrounding adjacencies, but then also with that lacy texture to allow that uh, the natural light can still um, enter the residences to kind of provide that warm ambiance to the interior spaces. <clears throat> So with the canopy planting plan, what the intent is, is to use the uh, Tababui Bahamiensis on the east and west buffer, uh, where we can get that columnar growth to soften the architecture um, and help provide a little privacy between the adjacent properties. On the south buffer, we intend to use the Simpson stopper tree um, as it is a small uh, native growing tree uh, that's on the FPNL um, approved list for the right tree, right place, as there are um, overhead lines along the back property line. The understory plan consists of a really uh, verdant green property uh, line hedge. We're using crabwood, which is also 
a native salt tolerant understory shrub um, that will provide that green curtain of foliage that will provide that nice privacy um, to all of the units um, and the surrounding adjacencies. And then we start layering with different plant textures of um, native shrubs and then using the subtropical philodendrons um, to kind of contrast the big leaf texture with the fine texture of that crabwood backdrop. And then lastly, up on the roof deck, as Carlos was describing, our, our intent um, is to use splashes of color with the uh, imperial tie bougainvillea, um, create a more sculptural um, planting within the planters using ficus green island, and then softening some of the facade with the silver buttonwood trees, and then lastly the green wall. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Christopher Bernard, I'm, I'm going to focus just on the waiver request and as, as just a follow up on the, on the landscape design. Uh, and if I can probably pull up the, this is a good one to show. The, the waiver request uh, relates to the requirement of the street trees along the front line of George Bush Boulevard. And uh, the requirement you know, be, be between the Florida Green Book and the, and the LDRs is that essentially there is to be a line of street trees uh, that are to be uh, 14 feet set back from the road, or as an alternative, they could be four feet from the road with uh, modifications to the uh, drainage trench at the front. There's two aspects of this property and the George Bush Boulevard specifically that justify the waiver that's requested. And specifically, at this property, during the front line of the property, there is an exfiltration trench that the city facilitates that in order to put these street trees at the 14-foot line, uh, we've concluded through the landscape architect and design that this would interfere with the exfiltration trench, bottom line. There are no variant of tree that wouldn't in interfere and, in, in essence, render the exfiltration trench uh, as inoperable to, for its purpose. Secondly, the al alternative option would be to put the tree line at four feet back from George Bush Boulevard. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, shall we say, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation is in the midst of a roadway plan on George Bush Boulevard that's going to be installing a valley gutter throughout the, throughout the entire stretch of the road. This is a benefit to the community, a benefit to the street. To put these tree line at the four foot line would require a modification of that drainage system. So in essence, what we would be doing is we would be seeking to alter the plan uh, put forward by the Florida Department of Transportation. We'd have to install our F or a D curb, and in essence, we would be making what are mini islands in front of each of these roadways. And by, by a, a pretty clear see of the design, what you're going to have is, uh, in essence, a little, you're going to have a, a number of islands in front of the roadway just in the interim of the, of, the, of, the, of the driveways. That, in essence, defeats the whole point of the, of the visual here. And, and it's not something that FDOT would, would likely approve, because what we'd be doing is we'd be seeking a complete modification of the, of the uh, valley gutter system that, that is in the plan for, the, for George Bush Boulevard. So just to go over the legalities of the, of the waiver, um, and as you've heard from the last presentation, the waiver, we will, we're required to have a finding that it will not adversely affect the neighboring area, will not significantly diminish the provision of public utilities, it will not create an unsafe condition and will not result in the grant of a special privilege in, the same, in that the same waiver would not be granted under similar circumstances on other property for another applicant or owner. Well, the unique aspect of this request is that the irony of the request is that if you don't grant this waiver, in fact, almost every one of those points will be made. Without granting the waiver, it would require that there would be an adverse effect on the neighborhood. 
we're going to be interfering with a, a, an exfiltration trench if we go to the 14-foot way, or we're going to be we're going to be altering for the benefit of one single piece of property along George Bush Boulevard. We're going to be altering the FDOT roadway plan and the valley gutter system. Again, uh, it will not significantly diminish the provision of, ut of public utilities. Well, in fact, if you don't grant the waiver, we will have to interfere with the provision of public utilities. We'll be interfering with the drainage system. It will not create an unsafe situation. Well, same goes for here. I mean, what we're doing is we're, we're putting trees in a system that will interfere with the whole intent of the system. And, and let me just say, go back to the, the, the purpose of the street trees. By the presentation you've just seen and some of the visuals, if I can maybe go back to the first, so you, the purpose of the street trees, oh, that's it. The purpose of the street trees is to give you a visual and a greenery at the front of the house, in front of the front of the property. Well, by the, by the look of what we have here, we're flush with greenery. In fact, on the second and third floor, there's greenery, which would model the whole objective of the tree line. And in fact, if you put it further than 14 feet, you're going to go right into the, you're going to mess with the structure. So, so we believe that the intent of the street trees is met even with a waiver. We've got ambient and plenty of foliage in the property. So again, it uh, will not result in the grant of a special privilege. Well, again, ironically, if you don't grant the waiver, what we would have to do is go to the FDOT and request a very special privilege for this one piece of property for us to modify the street gutter system. And aesthetically, it's not even uh, anything that I, I don't think the city would enjoy to see. What you see from this property is we'd, we'd have a raised curb in the front along the streetway. Uh, we'd have individual um, individual islands. Uh, it would aesthetically be defeating the point of the of the visual aesthetics of the property. And again, nothing's guaranteed that the FDOT would even grant such a request because we would be altering the very roadway plan that's in place for George Bush Boulevard. That's any questions? That's it for for me. But I appreciate the uh, time. All right. Uh, does that conclude your presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Buse for the city. If they clean this, it might help. <laughs> okay. This is at 1236 George Bush Boulevard. It is a class five site plan. Um, this is um, ex existing use is multiple family. It was a um, kind of a residential inn that was built, um, constructed back in 1966. We really couldn't find a closing date. We searched all over the place on online. Uh, we came up with 2021. Um, the property was part of the model land, so it's a very old piece of um, a plat that was recorded in 1921. The request is for a class five, the site plan, landscape plan, and architectural plan, and the landscape waiver. This is the site plan. This is the uh, basic, the development standards, which they had to meet for all of the lot area depth uh, all of the setbacks and I just wanted to point out to you um, with the rear setback uh, they do have 39 feet in the rear um, on their uh, uh, plans it says 25 feet so upon approval that that just needs to be changed they do meet um, they comply with the parking and uh, the photometrics the lighting these are performance standards that are spelled out in your staff report. They meet four of the nine. Most of these are for much, much larger infill projects. This is um, special requirements for, for specific uses with townhomes. I just want to point out um, one of them is uh, the platting. And upon approval of the class five, um, they will be going through the platting process. Um, the plat is in now. Um, so. So here is the landscaping. Um, 
the landscaping has been approved through um, and to be sufficient with the um, landscape regulations. Um, the waiver was requested for 4616H6, which is our street trees. This is the landscape foundation and planning schedule. This is the rooftop landscaping, which is proposed after 100 square feet, you're required to um, landscape 10%, and this is about 1,000 square feet of um, rooftop. This is the mitigation, the existing tree and palm removal and mitigation, and um, they will, the in lieu fee to be paid into the tree trust fund is 14,300. And here is the um, waiver request, and these are your findings. And um, there are currently no street trees that are being provided, so um, it is an opportunity to miss the beautification of street trees. The um, street trees may interfere, um, as stated before, with the exfiltration system. Um, there is no unsafe situation really not anticipated except for um, it could interfere as at, with the um, exfiltration system. And um, previous alternative designs to accommodate street trees um, have not been successful. And again, here I just wanted to lay out a little bit more. The street trees uh, went to the city engineer and he requested 14 feet from, feet from edge of pavement, um, which would place them directly over the exfiltration system, um, or the four feet offset, which would require the installation of curbs and conflict with the current FDOT roadway plan, which is providing the valley and gutter and um, so these are your architectural elevations and aesthetics, and this is the criteria that um, is required. That was the north and south, sorry. These are the east and west elevations. These are the required findings. The adjacent zonings on land use are compatible. The concurrency um, in your report, it meets the concurrency standards. Um, I'll discuss the consistency in one second, and we discussed the um, land development regulations um, just a second ago. So with the consistency, these policies through housing and the neighborhood um, can be and are um, supported by the comprehensive plan. These are just some technical notes that will be associated with uh, the approval. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing and hearing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. Uh, you have opportunity to make any uh, additional testimony or uh, rebuttal to the city's testimony. I don't think so, thank you. Okay, and Jen? I don't. All right, so to the board and uh, Carol, would you like to start on this one? Please. count okay. on you for this okay um mr nielsen can you answer some questions so if we i'm just i have to go back and forth to the plans because you know some of the sheets don't have your sizes and, and things like that but if you could um maybe go to sheet l701 could you explain the streetscape that that you've provided along George Bush. And because some of the trees on this, they're all black, so I can tell what's there. But when I go to your other sheets, some are in light gray and some are black, and I don't know what the difference is. Yes, the, the reason why we gray out, so along, so taking a step back, looking at along the street um, scape along the right of way are intent is to use um, the taller uh, Vichia foxtail hybrids um, interspaced between all of the driveway approaches to help break up the facade um, between each unit where we have a little bit larger uh, landscape um, islands between the driveways we are also including a uh, Clusia rosia a uh, native um, tree to again help uh, soften 
and create a little bit more of a garden um, environment within each of the driveway vehicular parking. Um, the reason why we gray out the trees in the drawing is in the tree and canopy plan, um, we are showing the trees that um, are in black so that they stand out more. When we go to the foundation planting plan, we want to see the trees in a, to relate to the foundation plantings, but we gray them out because the priority of the drawing that we are demonstrating is on the um, understory uh, shrubs that we're depicting for that specific drawing. Okay, so in one of those islands, like you're showing what, four or five palms? Yes. And that's what's going in. You're gonna have different levels of yes. palm trees in there, and then you have the Clusia roseas. Are there any way of moving those a little closer to the street? Or are you, are you um, bound by utilities and stuff? We're, we are bound by utilities. We uh, had many um, charrettes with the civil engineer, mm -hmm. um, the, the architects looking at how we can best um, accommodate the intent of providing um, a nice, vegetated right-of-way um, without impacting the utilities within the right-of-way and the utilities being provided to each unit um, in a detrimental way. Okay. Uh, and congratulations on getting through the uh, landscape requirements and table. That should be commended um, as that is a new table, which is um, cumbersome. Uh, so let me see. Um, how far back is the property line from like, the sidewalk? Is that where the, where is the exfiltration going? Is the exfiltration going between the sidewalk and the property line or is it going, yes. is there, is there a slide sorry, that depicts that? Do you want me to switch over to yours? Matthew Kahn, uh, Colford Wheeler, 7900 Glades Road in Boca. Let's see here. Is ours now? <laughs> so the existing exfiltration trench is uh, documented with the blue lines. It's entirely within the right of way and just up against the right of way line. Um, so to Tyler's point, you can see here where the exfiltration trench is located mm -hmm. um, relative to the trees that he's got on site. And between the trees that uh, Tyler has on site and the exfiltration trench in the right-of-way that's the city-owned trench, that's where all the utilities are, water, sewer, um, drainage of the, of the lots. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. I don't, I don't have any other... other, other. <coughs> Okay. Net. Um, this one is a little new to me in terms of the code asking for landscaping a hundred feet above, and this solution of a live wall. So, after this is built and sold, each individual owner is then responsible for the greenery off of their second floor, right? I'm gonna revert to maintaining it. Hmm? maintaining it. That's where I'm going, yeah. yeah so there would be, um, you know, within kind of the documents for the homeowners association of all six units for the landscaping and the maintenance and all of that, that would be um, essentially included that they would all agree to that there is going to be continual maintenance on anything landscaping and obviously anything visual so that it does not you know kind of fall into disrepair if one homeowner doesn't you know kind of take care of their portion if you will it would all be done and agreed to within those documents that it's going to be serviced by you know a third party company that's going to take care of everything and keep everything in you know good condition and good working order yeah, I, yeah, I forgot. It's it's a condo, so they're going to be okay. Yeah. Um, 
so as part of the condo association, it's still the owner responsibility or, or the association would be engaging a third party? Third party. It's, it's a third party. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So that answers that. Um, now, I, I understand the utilities and the undergrounding um, and, and the dilemma with the uh, trees, but I, I don't understand. Why are we not able just to, to step it back um, and place it on the property line? step back you're actually interfering with the structure itself so um, remember too there's there's multiple driveways here so but that's uh, a choice no it's well, a design it be, choice it would be a design feature of the entire structure um, and it would alter the, the entire footprint of the property in, in fact the point of the street trees is to provide a line along the street so to very much step this back kind of defeats the whole purpose of the street trees and I think the plan, the option in the plan that was presented through the landscape design was to, was to satisfy the need of the foliage along the, along the street by the design that's presented. So we saw that backing everything up would, in essence, render the entire project a different project, but would defeat the whole point of the street trees. You wouldn't have the trees along George Bush Boulevard. I, I agree. Can I just, sorry, I just want to ask or remind the applicant to try to use the microphone as much as possible so it's caught by the record. Sorry. So, and, and, and this is where legal is going to step in so we can't design from the dais. Here's what I'm going to say. Um, I personally don't find this project visually attractive. I know it's a design choice and such. And I think stepping it back and putting some... Um, greenery towards the front and softening would do a better job of softening the project itself, um, which I don't think is accomplished by the green wall in this case and the lack of trees on the street. So I, I do understand that my ask is or my concerns are two different concerns and doesn't necessarily address the issue of the street trees, but I think would ultimately make for a more attractive project if I were going to live along that line with that very modern building. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's just taste <laughs> and buyer's choice. Um, but those are my comments. Thank you. If, if I may, and I, and I appreciate the comments, I, I think that we, we might even listen a little bit more to the landscape design because the, the issue was less of a, a choice. The very fact and completely understand the, the concern, the very design, uh, the team had gone through a number of different variants. For example, to put the street trees or to put foliage along the street would have required, and, and I want to stress these F and D curbs are not attractive features, especially in a street that has a valley gutter. So a valley gutter is a very, very flat, uniform looking system. You would be talking about creating uh, what, are, what, are, what is like a speed bump in front of the, of the property for all the cars to go over. So, so even if we were to push the structure back, you still wouldn't succeed in accomplishing what you're bringing up, which is, in essence, um, more foliage in an area that we can't do because of the exfiltration trench, because of the valley gutter, and because of the utilities that are there. So, so to that degree, uh, the team's done its best to, to modify that look. I, I don't think that modifying the structure is going to accomplish any of those goals. You're still going to have what we have here in the design and and, and the team took a, a pretty extenuating circumstance to design those features through the actual visual of the of the structure okay. John no I noticed in, in your report you said may um, and what the contention I believe we have is that they're saying there's really no way that they could satisfy so there's some ambiguity there that what would solution to that be I mean I guess they would have to go to DOT and go through that hole correct um, and as they stated that um, FDOT is not the easiest um, entity to work with um, so they're saying by their findings 
they can't satisfy what the LDRs place. Mm -hmm. And Correct. what the city's position is on that is they may be right. Correct. Okay. Anything else? You know. So, um, yeah, I had similar concerns um, to Annette, uh, but I, they've been answered <laughs> to the best of our ability. Um, and as far as the um, aesthetic, you know, we can't design from the dais, so I understand that. I'm a little concerned about mixing gray, white, beige, and brown, which are almost two to separate <coughs> color palettes. So it's a little jarring for me. Um, I mean, they're very luxurious, certainly. I always ask, um, is there any sort of affordable housing here? I know, I know it's only six units. Percent. On the island, <laughs> okay. And then the other question I noticed in the report was about the um, parking and backing into George Bush Boulevard. Has anybody addressed that at all, or it's just it's just the way it is? I'm, I'm worried about the safety and the traffic. Uh, we can comment on that, but I would say that the Parliament Inn was. Uh, located there for a very long time. The flow of traffic in and out of the Parliament Inn, probably tenfold from what's going to be here. These are going to be six residences. Um, uh, so any uh, effect on traffic that would be estimated by this design is only going to be less of an effect than the, what had been existing at that property since 1966. You had a number of different drive-ins and drive-outs. Again, a uh, much higher volume of traffic. So the design is actually reducing, significantly reducing the traffic flow and, in effect, the effectual density uh, at, the, at the site as far as traffic would go. Um, Dana, if I may, um, we at very early on in the review process, it was brought up <clears throat> as we were going through the technical review. Um, we did mention it, and there is no land development regulation that states that you can't have back out parking. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Chris? Yeah. Sure. Um, a couple, couple quick questions. The access to the roof, you've got a parapet up there blocking the equipment on the, the top of the third floor, right? Uh, where's where's the access to that? Is it from a ladder? That's it's correct that there is a parapet. Um, the access would be I don't know, Carlos, if you can where the <clears throat> so yes, uh, to answer your question, it would be the way ladder. That is correct. The ladder, exterior ladder, but there's no plans for um, summer kitchens and stuff up on that on that floor. Okay. No. Um, the the, are the the fins on the second floor are those operable? Or are they? Are no, they, they are not. They're they're fixed. They're purely decorative. And what is the material? Aluminum. Aluminum. Yes, sir. And are, are they are they set on an angle like a like a pergola? Or are they straight? They're straight. Okay. Um, I know that site because I had a good friend who lived in the uh, condos just uh, east of you, and it sloped pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're going to have to put a lot of infill in there to, to avoid flooding. And uh, and the city engineers signed off on all, all of their elevations and stuff? Correct. He's reviewed it. And just to me, it would seem like the, uh, the, the westernmost driveway would have a fairly significant slope to it. But again, the engineers said that's, that's fine. Um, then uh, it, when DOT does that thing, are they putting a sidewalk on the, on the south side of... George Bush? I can't remember the plan, and for some reason, I don't know if it goes all the way down there because I think somewhere along the lines, it starts to chop up with yeah, the sidewalk. They, they do. They're they putting do? the sidewalk okay. in there, right? And then they're putting one of those ugly green bike lanes all along the whole thing, too? I think no that's no bike what lane. is not down there. Well, they're not doing a bike lane there. I think the bike lane is what doesn't go all the way down. Something doesn't go all the way down, and I was kind I of surprised. They lane across the bridge so they <laughs> change the plan a little bit so they don't even go anywhere east of the bridge and the bike lane well good you guys are gonna you'll, you'll appreciate not having that green stripe in front of the house <laughs> um, 
And then I just, just for the record, make the point, you know, that uh, once again, we, we have uh, an applicant who's, uh, who's is removing every single tree from the, from the property. Um, it's, I know it's easier to work from a clean slate, um, but I'd love to, love to some, some, someday see people come in and say, well, listen, you know, this is kind of a neat tree. It's been here a long time. Let's try and save that. Let's try and build around it. Um, but you've mitigated most of the trees, I trust, because you're, you're only paying $14,000 into the, into the tree fund. But um, I know you guys are doing a lot of work around town. Any trees you can save, let's try and do that. Thank you. Even? Yep. <clears throat> so uh, is this an accurate rendering that we're looking at with the trees? No, not with the landscape, no. The, the intent of the rendering is obviously to illustrate the architecture. So is there is there a more accurate rendering, or is there, or is there a uh, which which show show I, in the landscape? I, no, sir. Suggest we look at. I just want to uh, go to the next slide. In, in order, would you like to see the uh, landscape? What? Yes. Uh, wait. I'll go back. Yeah. That, that's so th this this is not going to show all the all the trees. This is the architectural site plan. Okay. So I'm still trying. I'm trying to understand this. Uh, what do you, what are you calling it? The valley gutter. Valley gutter. That that those are the double lines there. Is that? That, that is correct. There, where the car is crossing over. Yes. Okay. And you can't put trees. Uh, toward that because there's utilities underneath? Is that what's going on? I will show you the... This is illustrating where the exfiltration is in comparison to the... Uh, to Everything the... in blue? It's yes. surrounded? Okay, so that you can't put trees there. That is correct. Okay. So then your proposal is going to where the cross those X's, the, the asterisks, those are where palm trees are? Is that what? I'm yes. trying to read that diagram. Yes, yes, the um, symbols are illustrating palms. Okay. So, okay, those are the typical all palms. And then you said you were gonna soften it up with kind of like uh, understory trees? Yes, um, we're, we're using crab wood, uh, wild coffee, um, various forms of philodendrons um, to soften up the okay. front of the architecture. Right. And so the, uh, the, the business with the live walls on the third floor, that, that was an attempt to kind of soften up the, the hardscape. That's correct. And that's something that's maintained by uh, like the, the landscape folks with yes. the rest yes. of the, like yes. the grass and everything. How, how do they get up there? They, they, just, they have like cherry pickers or how does they, how do they get up there to, to trim all that or to maintain that, you know? Uh, they would have to go through the provide, units. Yeah, ownership would have to provide access. So it, inside the house. Wow, okay. Good point, Stephen. Oh, it looks good. I mean. <laughs> advantages and disadvantages to having that I guess all right and uh, the watering is, is, is taken care of of, of those uh, heart, of the third floor there's like a watering system for that yes yes there would be an integrated irrigation system okay. on the third floor uh, okay well and those are pretty uh, pretty upscale Properties. But thank you, Carol. In um, your review, did you notice the staff note about the um, was the Simpson stoppers in the no. back? No. There. Um, it was recommended um, in the rear. There's Simpson stoppers, and uh, again during staff review, it was recommended that they move them five feet so that they didn't interfere with um, the utilities. 
Well, a uh, Simpson stopper is a small tree, and it's approved by FPNL, so I don't know um, why they would have to move them. I would think they would be able to put them anywhere that they wanted to put them. Um, they can also be trimmed. They're not, um, you know, it's, it's a multi-trunk tree that you're using. Uh, we're using a single leader. Single leader, um, yeah, they can be trimmed. I don't see an issue with it. But. Thanks. And there's, there's utility lines right back there. So that's why they are, you know, they're stuck with in that uh, a smaller tree. I, mean, I had the same concerns that some of the other people expressed about the uh, backing out, but I certainly acknowledged that that was the same issue with the Parliament Inn. Um, I think overall this is uh, certainly an improvement over what happened to the Parliament Inn over the years. It went from being a very lovely, very lush property to being a kind of run down and uh, not what it once was. Um, so this is definitely a, a, an improvement. I had been wondering what was going to happen there. I've seen some activity there. Um, I don't see anything that we really need to take any additional actions on or pressure for any additional uh, changes on here. Um, I don't love it, but I think it fits with property that they have and the constraints that they have to work with. So that's my opinion. Any other board members have any additional comments now that we've kind of had a round here? All right, I would entertain a motion if someone wants to make one. We don't need to, uh, Mr. Bennett, we don't need to uh, vote separately on the waiver? It's included in the? Is it included in the motion, Jen? I yes. don't think it is. Yes. Typically, it's oh, just it, it included is, it in is the included. motion. It is there, Jen, I'm sorry. Okay, great. Okay, um, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, Class 5 2022 dash uh, 14 site plan, landscape plan, and architectural elevations, which with request for waiver from LDR section 4.6.16 H6 for 1236 George Bush, Bo George Bush Boulevard by finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Thank you. And a second? Second. Uh, David, maybe first by That's a close. fraction of a second. <laughs> Pun intended. Annette Gray? No. Carol Perez? Yes. Grace Patton? Yes. John Brewer? Yes. Dana Postabler? Yes. Stephen Cohen? Yes. Tom LaRue? Yes. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're now on, I believe, we got through all of our shuffled around uh, items and we're on to uh, nine and we'll start off with city staff. Amy, anything uh, for us? I'm not even gonna even try to see any of that. So um, <laughs> we all have glasses up here. It's no, there's no I've got my contacts in. I just, yeah, we'll have to work on that. Um, just, you know, the usual reminders, our next meeting is June 22nd. Um, I will not be here for that meeting. I'm not sure which principal planner will be your liaison for the June meeting. And then um, we'll, we're still at the moment planning to still just have one meeting um, for July, and I believe it's July 27th, possibly. Okay. Um, but any changes, we'll keep you all updated. And you know, always, if you have any questions, reach out. We're here. Thank you. And thank you for all the adjustments tonight. Made it fun and interesting. <laughs> Bill, anything? No, just thank you very much, guys. All right, board members? I've, I've got a question. So what what rule is it that they have to have? When do they have to have landscape up on the floors above? Like, what is the, why do they have to do that? What's the code requirement? Um, why do they have to have? They, they have meaning the landscape? previous item? Yeah. What's the code requirement? So it's 433RR3C is in the staff report. Um, it just says rooftop uses greater than 100 square feet located below the maximum building height shall landscape a minimum of 10% of the use area. If you're located at the maximum building height, uh, you're required to provide 20%. So do they have a rooftop um, use there? 
They're required, they're required to provide landscaping because they're using their roof. And it depends on whether they're so many feet below the, okay. Correct, that's an LDR amendment that we processed uh, last year um, and was approved in 2021. I think it's gonna be, it will be strange to have, you know, people are gonna have to take a bunch of dirt and stuff through your, <laughs> yeah. your house. You're gonna have to have irrigation, things are gonna break down. I mean, I think it's, yeah. it seems problematic when on a, uh, on a residential project, but you know, it's not like an amenity deck where there's access. And they're gonna have like a busy HOA board, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With only six residents, someone's gonna be in charge of that basically. And someone's not gonna be happy. They don't do it. Like what? They could probably uh, revoke their property from them. And then what happens when they stop? What happens if they just don't maintain their? Become a code they, enforcement or if it's issue. Vacant, I guess. If it's <laughs> and then what? What are you gonna do? You cite them. Start charging them mm -hmm. fees. All right. Fine. Yeah. Yep. And a strong wind is going to be an issue. All right. Okay. Move to adjourn. All righty. Thank Move. you all. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Getting close. Put an application in for something else. I'm hungry. I had enough.